You're listening to Coding Blocks, episode 77. Subscribe to us and leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, and more using your favorite podcast app. <laughs> this is CodingBlocks.net. We can find show notes, examples, discussion, and a whole lot more. Follow us on Twitter at CodingBlocks or head to www.CodingBlocks.net and find all our social links there at the top of the page. With that, I'm Alan Underwood. I'm Joe Zach. And I'm Michael Outlaw. All right. With that, it's time for our podcast news, and we always like to start off with reviews. And with that, Jay-Z, you want to take iTunes? I do. So uh, iTunes, thank you big time to Frodo McNuggets, 007 <laughs> Benny. <laughs> I'm already cracking up. <laughs> Likely suspect, Marcus Raspich, Alex 13CP, uh, the Clink family, especially big thank you to the Clink family. That, that was, was awesome. Great review. <laughs> Uh, Chris Sean Hayes, uh, Deleted, Grim42, and Zach Reeves. Yep. And on Stitcher, we have Roca88, Destructs, <laughs> The Code Itself, Joe is Dev for Life. Oh, huge thank you guys. Uh, great names, too. <laughs> <laughs> awesome ones in there. I really appreciate yep. it. So it's that time of year again where Stack Overflow announces their 2018 survey results or their survey results for 2018. Um, did you guys, either of you guys see this yet? I have not looked at it. There are some really interesting things that came out of it. Um, what do you think, what do you think the most popular framework library or tool is? Well, hold on. Let me go ahead and open this up and I'll tell you. Oh, geez. No, I, uh, I'm going to guess no I, JS. Go ahead. No JS. I'd probably go with that as well. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But here was the one that I didn't expect to come out on top above when, you know, set for second place, Angular beat out React. You know, we saw that in the survey we did for uh, JetBrains licenses not too long yeah. back. Yeah. It, I, I guess it doesn't surprise me because Google's had, had quite the fight. And remember, React just recently went to a more accessible license. Mm -hmm. So a lot of companies probably wouldn't even touch them for that reason. So yeah, maybe it was, it was a pretty big one though, but um, man, I'm trying to think what were some other things in here? Like, uh, you know, most, most popular database. I thought that one kind of went, you know, I was more, I, I expected number one. So you MySQL. can guess it. Yep. My was number one. Okay. I was actually kind of surprised to see SQL server was the second, not most surprising. popular yeah and oracle was like way down the list postgres was number three i take it yep yep, yep. um i have not cheated <laughs> i've got three you've got you've got three what i've got three things i was going to call out on the survey okay <laughs> okay we're still ahead. scrolling through i was going to go ahead and go uh how much time do developers spend on a computer you guys want to guess an hour per week or what oh gosh you know it doesn't say i assume it was per day no, it was per day. Okay, per day. per day. I'm going to say 11 hours. Uh, Outlaw? I, I remember looking at that one, but I don't remember. I think it was in like the, it was a range given. It was given as a range, if I remember right. Uh, so it was okay. like 9 to 12 or something like that. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That, that so means. yeah, 9 to 12, 52% uh, of uh, developers spend 9 to 12 hours a day at a computer. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy, but I, I mean, I totally do. So Yeah. And, and along that one too, I thought this one was interesting that um, kind of we'll, we'll get to the survey results from the last one, but uh, you know, healthy habits, how often do you exercise, right? Like we asked the same type of question, not worded the same way, but I, I thought like, oh, that's, that's uh, interesting timing. Yep. I mean, I'm sure we influenced their, their, <laughs> their <laughs> But survey. of course we did, right? Right. I mean... <laughs> Surely they, they I mean, looked. Stack Overflow is not that big. All right. I mean, how that, how'd that one end up? Um, I, I, we'll save that conversation okay. for uh, Sorry, yeah. later. But, um, yeah, there was another one here. I was trying to get in here too, like most dreaded framework or language. Most dreaded Objective-C. Visual Basic. Ooh. Visual Basic Co 6. Really? What about COBOL? Number two. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what number one might be. JavaScript, did it hit number one in all the categories? <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> wow. Well, well it, here's one, though, because uh, most dreaded framework, 
You know, and we said that Angular was number two. Angular was number four for the most dreaded framework. So, I, but they're they're probably referring to version one dot X. Oh, it's funny. Yeah, man. Well, I mean, they Stack Overflow didn't specify yeah. because also on that list was Node.js. Really? Which Node.js was number one before? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, so, kind of, so JavaScript kind of is sprinkled in there. It's most dreaded database? Uh, DB2. Mongo. Mongo. Mongo and what did you say, Joe? DB2. Yep, DB2. Really? Wow. Yeah. And, and number two was Oracle. Oracle, really? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. What about, what do you think the most popular IDE is? Stack Overflow. Know your audience. Um, I know the answer. It, it's going to be Visual Studio. Visual Studio? Yeah. You're wrong. Really? It was Visual Studio Code. Code. Yeah. 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 But not by much. Visual, Visual Studio is number two. And yeah, it, was, yeah. it was close. Now, here's where it gets, we, we've had this conversation before. Let's round out the top five. What do you think number three, number four, and number five were? These are going to be hard, right? Um, JetBrains, JetBrains, JetBrains. Okay. There's his answer. Sublime. Okay. Uh, what's the, is it Adam? The, the, okay, the, Adam. Yeah, Sublime, Adam, and Vim. Okay. Well, you did really good, man. You got two out of those three, and I did not expect that. I did not see that coming. Sublime was number four. Okay. And Vim is number five. And we've had this conversation about like, hey, is it just a text editor? You know, are these things just text editors right. or are they IDEs? And you know, they're in this IDE conversation. Notepad++ is the one you forgot oh, at number wow. three. That makes sense. I mean, it's a great little tool. I wouldn't call it an IDE, but. Wow. Well, like, where are the Java developers that aren't answering the survey? Like, what side are they using? Well, IntelliJ was number six. Okay. It was on the list. And Android Studio was next, and Eclipse was. Uh, so your your next three, so six, seven, and eight, were all uh, Java development platforms. Awesome. Okay. So they were they were there. All yeah. right. How about how about we've asked the question about multiple monitors? Oh yeah. What do you think? What do you think the Stack Overflow respondents? Sixty percent. Yes. No, no, no. Do they have one, two, three, four, five monitors? Oh, I'm going to say two is the, the predominant. The norm? Yeah. Okay. 51% two. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Was the next one? Uh, that's what I would think. The, yes, one monitor was, was definitely the, uh, the next one. Yeah, there, there were a bunch of interesting things on here, though. I don't, what were the other ones that you were going to bring up, Joe? Uh, most pop- popular technologies... Uh, what do you think the uh, top three were for most popular on uh, Stack Overflow survey? C this Scar- could be language. This could be JavaScript is definitely going to be a JavaScript. There. JavaScript number one at seventy percent, and there's a, there's overlap with the percent. Seventy. Yes, but seventy percent. I mean, seventy percent of people said yes to JavaScript. It was multi-select. Uh, HTML and CSS were number two and three. Oh, really? Wow. So, yeah. ja- so it's literally all web. <laughs> like it's almost predominantly web. Yeah, and it's funny to think like if you're if you're on Stack Overflow, you're probably a web developer, and you probably work with Microsoft and uh, JavaScript. Yep, it's kind of interesting. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I just have one more. Yep. All right. What is it? Uh, what do developers use to stay comfortable while working? And uh, this is another multi-select, but I, I thought the numbers were were really uh, interesting. So, 52 per, uh, percent of respondents said they had an ergonomic keyboard or mouse. So, okay, higher than it was 10 years ago, five years ago, even no I would doubt. say. Yeah. 50% with Sandy Desk. Really? That's 50%. a lot, dude. Yeah. Was like, that do most workplaces? Right? Yeah. yeah. So with, I thought that was crazy. Like, wow, like, well, where, where is everybody working? <laughs> I need to go there. <laughs> I am standing right now at my Sandy Desk. That's all. Uh, wrist hand supports, 22%. And fatigue relieving mat, which I also have, 12%. Those are important. Those really are. Yeah, I even wear shoes on my mat. <laughs> yeah. What do you think the uh, most popular way developers learn on their own is? Video. Video? Okay. Uh, like, getting started like, guides. Getting started. The official documentation and or standards for the technology was number one. Wow. Two was questions and answers on Stack Overflow. 
And then three were like books from other like O'Reilly or, you know, other public. So public video stream. wasn't even in the top three. That's interesting. Yeah, no, I was actually kind of surprised by that one too. So yeah. What about why do people participate? What do you think the number one answer people participate, why they participate in the hackathon? Uh, networking. networking. <laughs> nope. You're way down the list. That would actually be the fifth answer. So it's actually to learn skills. Nope. That would be the number two answer. Come on. What's all right. Hold number on. one answer. Prizes. prizes. Uh, no, that was actually the last place. Come answer. on. You guys are like all over the map here. This is great. That would have been like what the seventh answer. The seventh answer was uh, for the prizes. I think Joe and I have said the same thing for every, every slot. Uh, I think he's just watching your mouth and he's like, what's he going to say? <laughs> there were prizes. Yeah. I don't know, man. Um, no, the n- number one answer was because I find it enjoyable. Okay. Yeah. Do you think uh-huh. so? That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about like um, how many developers are students? So Actively students right percentage. now? Percentage. So like, this is a percentage. Percentage of the respondents to the survey. 12%. 12% are students. 35. 35% are students. Well, um, you're closer, but you're Price still off. Right. Dog on it. Uh, developer students, seventy four percent were no. So twenty six. Yeah, the remaining twenty six ish percent were in the yes, either full time or part time categories. Mm. That's that's cool stuff. I'm gonna go check out that thing. Uh, we'll uh, if you guys have anything interesting that you find on there, drop us a, a comment on the show notes because I mean, it, it is fun stuff and. <clears throat> And actually, so, I, all right, I know Jay-Z's got something up next, but mine flows well into this one, so I'm going to steal this particular slot. So this kind of goes hand in hand with what we had talked about on the previous episode where, like, languages that are dying, you know, those type of things. And we got several comments on that particular thing that we spoke about on, on episode 76, so like Joseph, Keegan, Nicholas. So I think one thing to note, and, and we've mentioned this before, right? Like at no point are we actually meaning any kind of dogging on any particular language. And, and to a certain degree, I do also believe that predicting which languages are going to die is sort of silly, right? Like I think, I think it was uh, Nicholas who actually said that this is silly. And, and I agree. It is interesting, though, to take a look at what, what the trends are in the market so that if you go to learn something, you know, what are the hottest ones? right? Like, do you want to invest your time in something that, that may not be as marketable? Now that I think that's not silly, but predicting whether or not something's going to be around in a year or whatever, like it's, it's hard to say, right? I mean, it's almost like predicting whether or not your Bitcoin's going up or down today. So, you know, I, I wanted to say that just kind of to put it out there, like, you know, we talk about these things because we find these articles and it's just interesting stuff to talk about, but by no means take that as a, as a hit to, you know, if you're working in a company and you're doing great things with Haskell or whatever, right? Does that mean you should stop doing it if some survey out there said, hey, this is no longer relevant? No, man. Like, that doesn't make sense. So, you know, just just wanted to put it out there because, you know, I, I know people have gotten upset about, you know, us playing around with PHP or, or something <laughs> like that in the past. And that's by no means what we intend to do. We're going to joke about it. We joke about C Sharp, right? Well, not as much because we love it, but, you know. Do we? I, I do. I mean, you got to diversify, right? It just makes sense. It, you think of it like an investment. So it makes sense, like, no matter what language you're in, to at least have some JavaScript on your resume. Apparently, 70% of developers are working with it. So that would be a good one. But I mean, especially if you're on those lists, like, it doesn't mean it's a bad language. It doesn't mean it's right, whatever. But it's something to consider, you know, for managing your career that, you know, you do want to make sure that you've got, like, a something that you could pivot if you need to. Yeah. All right. So now back to yours, seeing as I, I leapfrogged you. Yeah, all good. Um, this past weekend, I had the uh, the um, honor of hosting a uh, productivity and tech roundtable. We got a couple of people on uh, a Zoom, which is what we're using right now. And we talked about differences between programmers and management and what it meant for programmers who want to move to management or maybe why programmers don't want to um, go into management. And so it was a really interesting talk. We had um, Will from Complete Developer, um, also um, Darren. Uh, Active Fire, we talked about several times, of course, hosted show. So if you're uh, interested in that topic, then you should go check out this YouTube video. We'll have a link in the show notes. Awesome. Man, I wish I had made that. It was just kind of at an inconvenient time on Saturday because I would have loved to have been a part of that topic. <laughs> what were you What were you doing uh, the week before, man? Come on. 
<laughs> I was a little bit busy, right, uh, out at the uh, Microsoft MVP Summit, which basically just drained you of it, – it's an amazing time. You meet some awesome people. By the way, if anybody knows Brandon Sargent, you know, seek him out – or Brandon Padgett. I'm sorry, not Sargent. Brandon Padgett. Seek him out and ask him to show you some yo-yo tricks. Like, it's amazing. <laughs> we, we had a great conversation, but, dude, like, I, I was like a little kid watching him. So, um, but, yeah, I mean, just an awesome time and – drinking through a fire hose of information, but coming back and losing three hours from Seattle to the East coast and then getting kicked in the teeth with daylight savings time has been a little rough, but you know, it, it was, it was an awesome week and we might have a tip or two in the, uh, in the tip section here that kind of came from some of that information. So hang around. All right. And uh, can you guys hear my mouse by the way? I know it's been kind of loud lately. Is there anything I can do about that? Oh man. Have any so suggestions for me? All right. So check this out guys. It, 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 this came up because outlaw was like, man, in the previous episode, your mouse was just like a shotgun going off. Right? I mean, I didn't sound like that. <laughs> he might've said that. <laughs> hey man, your mouse is like really loud. <laughs> That's what, hey, I don't have that much space in my voice. <laughs> um, all right. So at my house, like I, I literally have my PC in front of me and then right next to me is my wife's gaming PC slash whatever. Right. And my kids will want to play Ark. And if you know anything about Ark or any game that a kid plays, it's literally they just want to keep biting and shooting and hitting things, right? And so they just click, 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 click. And I literally almost lost my mind one day. And I was like, there's got to be such a thing as a silent mouse. And sure enough, there is. So I ended up buying one. I'll have a link to the Amazon thing. I think it's like 16 bucks or 17 bucks. It's 20 not, bucks. 20 bucks. All right. So maybe it went up since. Um, but man, oh, I can't even hear it. It is blissful. Is right next to me. I know they're clicking it a thousand times per minute, and I don't hear it. And it is the most amazing feeling on the planet not to hear that thing. So, it looks cool, too. Yeah, it, the shape of it isn't great. I, I don't, like, anytime I've used it, it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't feel substantial, but it, it serves its purpose. So, you know, if you want a silent mouse, I, I've, got, I've got a link for you. Uh, the promotional picture's got, like, a guy in a laptop in bed next to uh, – his spouse and he's here clicking away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I'd do that, but you know. <laughs> where are you looking at, honey? Oh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was quiet. Go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is the last episode for reals about uh, clean architecture. So this is your last chance probably for a while to uh, leave a comment on the episode and win that particular book. So we'll probably be doing cool stuff in the future. I don't know. Stay tuned. But if you want to win a picture, uh, a picture, a copy of um, Clean Architecture, and that's international too. You guys are awesome. Yep. And uh, yeah, just leave a comment and we will pick one. And we will yeah. mail you a picture of the book. Yeah. So be prepared. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm extra awkward tonight. <laughs> uh, and by the way, we've mentioned this before. If you do have anything, like if you're, you know, pining for that pro site subscription or you have any books that you're interested in, go check out our codingblocks.net slash resources. We put things up there that we personally really like and use. And if you are planning on buying any of that stuff, you know, please click those links on that page. It won't cost you any more. In some cases it might actually save you money and you'll be helping support the show. So, you know, thank you for that. And with that, it's time to start. Yeah. Now, so corner you gonna get is it me is it, is it, you're breaking up okay I can do this all day so <laughs> so let's get started with services great and small so there's this little buzzword out there about uh you know well there's a couple of them service oriented architectures and microservices right and they're they're all the rave right or I think we've talked about how like maybe there's the uh, the backlash now on the microservice architecture. Yeah. yeah. And, and you'll typically see this thing listed as like SOA for service oriented architecture. And I don't know. Is there an acronym for the microservices? I don't know that I've ever seen that thing. abbreviated. Wait, yeah, but it's really small. So you can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> Great point. Uh, so yeah, man, there's definitely a backlash, right? Like at one point it was, Hey, microservice, all the things. And it's like, wait a second, this makes everything really hard. Right. So back off that. Let's let's go mono again. And, and you know, there's probably a balance somewhere in between. Yeah, in fact, I feel like there was a 
a talk given along those times. I, I'll have to find it now. Um, where like Uber, didn't they have a talk where they like, they went completely microservice with everything? This was a few years back. Oh, I don't Spotify, know. Spotify, we weren't they the, the one that everyone always talks about? Okay. Well, oh, did they go microservice and then backed off of it? Oh, no, they didn't do the back off. They just wrote a big article about kind of splitting their teams up and organizing, and organizing oh. around the services. Actually, I found it. The title, the title was, uh, and it is Uber, uh, What I Wish I Had Known Before Scaling Uber to 1,000 Services. Yeah, Ouch. We'll include a link to that. That would be the, painful uh, for anybody. In the show. So I definitely think that if your company or your organization or a programmer is telling me about the organization and they mention that they've got microservices, I just naturally kind of assume that that means that there's been someone who's been kind of steering that and thinking about architecture at a high level. And that to me, you know, or as I'm reading this chapter, it made me kind of realize that I have this kind of bias of thinking like, oh, well, if you're microservicing, then you've put a lot of thought into your architecture and you're probably splitting stuff off well. You've, you've done a really good job and you've handled uh, the deployment issues and your DevOps and you've really got your stuff together. After reading that chapter, um, he kind of makes a distinction and says, you know, basically services and particularly microservices don't mean that you have any sort of architecture. Right, which I thought was awesome. It, it was a great call out because you have a bunch of services, they must be decoupled, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, so that's, I guess that's one of the, uh, the fallacies of that kind of thinking is that you think of services and microarchitecture or microservices and service-oriented architectures, you, you think of these things as being strongly decoupled and that you can de- develop them and deploy them independently of one another or of their, you know, quote, users. Yep. But then you actually take a step back and you say, are these things truly decoupled? Like if I, if I release my new, if I release an update to my microservice, does it have any impact downstream? Like I added a new field to mine or something like that. All of a sudden you start realizing these things are way more coupled than what you thought they were because now you can't independently deploy this thing because it's going to break everything downstream of it, right? Like all these other services that were depending on that thing, it now has a different set of data types that are coming in and it's like, well, I don't know what to do with this. Yeah, and I mean, the only thing I can think of is if you have like a, if you're a truly large service, you know, if you're a provider of some service and it's truly large, like massively at scale, like a Google or a Facebook or something like that, then, and you might have versions of your service running concurrently, then I could see the argument where it's like, oh no, I can have multiple versions of my service running and everything. And then it's not gonna be a problem, but you know, for the average company because okay going back even to the stack overflow survey right like the largest um when they talked about the size of the companies right like most people were in companies larger less than a hundred people right that that was the largest uh category you know that the respondents picked uh, highest percentage so you know most of us aren't working in a in an organization where we're supporting thousands upon thousands upon thousands of users where we might be doing that so if you're realistically are you going to have multiple versions of your service in use maybe right maybe not so much so yeah, then you get into what you're saying we're like hey I, I added a new field or you know we needed to deprecate the use of a field right yeah i think that microservices are definitely a solution to certain problems but it's not the default answer for organization by by any means so yeah i think you need to justify that decision before you make it and we actually had some really good advice uh, from uncle bob in an earlier chapter where he said, don't start out with microservices. Start, you start out and build your stuff as if they've got you know, nice boundaries and, and services and uh, you know, manage your dependencies and work towards the interface so that you can split things off if you need to. So you know, don't shut that door, but you don't have to dive into it immediately. And actually, uh, I got to start a really great, uh, really great talk from uh, Facundo, which I'm going to be uh, checking out here at Orlando CoCamp again. Um, and he's um, a developer here in Orlando who uh, he does some consulting and he's done, done a lot of moving companies um, to um, microservices or moving away from or helping them get them to the cloud, just working with microservices services. and had a really um, great talk on uh, some kind of QA around it. And um, he definitely wasn't pushing it. You know, he was, uh, um, he took a very practical approach and really liked it. So I'm hoping to find a, a link and I'll throw that uh, in the show notes if I can find one for that talk. But I thought it was really good. It kind of um, changed my 
thinking on microservices. And so I think if you can build your app, if you can, I don't want to say monolith, you know, cause that kind of implies things I don't mean here, but if you can build your applications such that they have these nice clean boundaries and layers, then you're leaving yourself open to future expansion, but you're not forcing that upon anyone. Okay. Yeah. So you basically, he, this is kind of goes back to, uh, I think we had this conversation before where he's like services are not an architecture. There was a similar conversation from, you know, several chapters back or something along those same kind of lines. I can't recall it exactly, but you know, any services that separate these application behavior that do nothing more than separate these application behaviors are just expensive function calls. Isn't that beautiful? You're just adding latency for this, the sake of it, but it, you know, you're not necessarily improving your architecture. Latency and complexity, right? Because now yeah, these things point. all have to be managed and deployed and did this thing die? Does it need to fail over to another version of it? Like there's, I mean, yeah. when you really start thinking through it and how you have to, to keep these things alive and all, you know, in good, in good health, man, it's, it's not a small problem to solve. Yeah. I think a lot of organizations put off the actual deployment of it until kind of near the end or they don't really think about it until things are getting ready to launch like a version two or a new project or something. Uh, I definitely think that some of the problems that you encounter with microservices can be kind of solved, or at least you could recognize them early on by getting in a nice CI pipeline going and deploying these things and make sure that it makes sense to deploy them independently and you're not just always having to push all these things up all at once because they're actually totally tightly bound to each other you just got a really complicated monolith now he does make the point though to call out that just because you might want to break these things up into services it doesn't mean that necessarily every service has to be architecturally significant and that you know it needs to be strongly decoupled or anything like that like you know, sometimes you, you could break those things apart into services and that doesn't necessarily make it wrong or bad. Right. Right. Just like if you have a function that's dependent on something else, it doesn't, again, he, he drew the, the parallel there, you know, not everything's going to be perfect and you do have to make trade off, make trade offs for, you know, time versus productivity versus, you know, whatever else you got to do for maintaining the thing. Yeah. I mean, he calls that like, you know, e even if you're breaking the dependency rule here, there, there are sometimes there are benefits to this where having that functionality separated out might benefit your particular use. Maybe it's a scale problem, you know, maybe like breaking that one piece out, uh, you can now horizontally scale that one service, right? Which, you know, for whatever problem you're trying to solve might help, even though you're still strongly coupled to it, right? Maybe you didn't do it in like the most, you know, quote, ideal way. Yeah, and if you remember the dependency rule, it was that source code dependencies can only point inwards. And it's really important, not only is inwards inwards and not outwards, but it also means not to the side, right? So that means these services right. shouldn't be calling each other because they're, then they're tightly bound to each other. They need to be yeah. going through a, a layer of indirection. And, and an example to kind of bring this to the real world for what, what they just said was when they, when they don't the benefits might be horizontal scaling, right? So let's say that you have just, for instance, a database behind the scenes that can take, you know, thousands of transactions per second. That's not a problem. But let's say that you have a web server that sort of maxes out at 8,000 transactions per second, but you need more of these things coming in, right? It might make sense to break that service across multiple boxes that could then take in, you know, multiple thousands of those requests, right? So that's a case to where, you know, I, I mean, you could make up all kinds of things, but like credit card processing, right? You don't want to be bottlenecked by a particular server if you have to handle a high amount of transactions. So it might make sense to break apart that one service from your application so they can take in as many of those things as possible, right? And then maybe queue it up and add it to the database or something. So that's sort of an example of when that might matter, even though you don't care about drawing these specific boundaries, you just need something that will scale, right? Yep. And uh, I really like on um, the next section here talking about the benefits of services and there are plenty of benefits of services, but decoupling is not one of them. And I think that's, that's one that we kind of like instantly go to, but th there are others, you know, like being able to independently scale or deploy or whatever. But if these services are calling each other then they're absolutely coupled, just like your code can be coupled. It is funny because like you said, when you hear microservices or service oriented architectures, you just automatically assume, oh, well, they, you know, they architected this thing to be just, you know, amazing and all separate and independently runnable. And that's not the case, typically. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah I almost think like I meet somebody and I meet up. They're like, oh, we, yeah, we do, uh, use mar- microservices. I'm like, oh my gosh, do you work at Google? <laughs> right? Or Amazon, AWS? Yeah, exactly. Let me, let me ask you guys this. When you think of uh, using microservices, what is your like thinking behind it? Like why, why you would want that, why that was needed? I'm curious if your go-to answer is the same as mine. Mine? Or thought. Go ahead, Joe. What's yours? For me, it's ind- being able to independently release and independently scale, but primarily just the ability to release one part without having to release the others. So if you've got these things tightly bound, then to me, you've lost the primary benefit, at least from my understanding. So mine would be reliability. Mine's, so I know most people would think that I would think scale, um, but mine is more along the lines of you have two of these things standing up. So if one fails, it can, you can easily swap over to the other one. Like I would think that reliability would be the primary benefit and scale would probably so be So scale, next. reliability, and, and Joe's was what again? Independent His was scale. Deployability. Oh. Independent deployability. Yeah. Or being able to work at things in kind of parallel and like being able to release things and, you know, like updating the version number, but not necessarily affecting any existing behavior. And you're basically treating your services like third parties. Right. That, that is not like neither of you were thinking if it's interesting how we all have the three of us each had a different takeaway. Um, mine is just that if I think that there's a need for microservices because you have some idea that you might want to reuse that by other applications. Hmm. Right. So you're thinking of like an external API. I'm thinking like of that. it as like, it's part of an external API. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I was just curious, you know, a little, little side tangent topic there. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I'm looking at a list here and like all our stuff is in there in the, the top, whatever. This, this article has like 30 different pros for it though. So I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> yeah, there's a few. But, but we yeah. hit the high points. Yeah, and we talked about just a minute ago, like they are tightly bound because of the data they share, right? If you typically, you don't have just some central app that calls out to a service and then it gets something back and calls out to another service. Typically, it's almost like a waterfall effect, right? Like you call service A and it's going to call service B and then it's going to call service C. And that's how you end up, that's how they all become tightly bound because they are all aware of each other to some certain degree and the data inputs and outputs that they, that they have to publish. So an example might be, and I'm thinking off the top of my head, so maybe this would be a messed up example. But if you wanted to do some kind of an authentication, right, then maybe your first iteration, you're like, you know what, I only need you to pass in a username and a password. And I'll, I will verify from there. But then on a subsequent one, you might think, you know what, um, we've changed our the way we handle our encryption. And so we don't want the salt necessarily with right next to the encrypted version. So you're going to pass me in your salt as well. Uh, that's probably a really messed up. Like anybody knows encryption is probably like, what? Yeah, you don't wrong. pass your salt around, but, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm thinking like, uh, you know, the th- point is, is like you would pass in, you know, now suddenly you need to pass in a third thing. You're like, hey, we, we have to deprecate the use of that other one because we've changed the way we're handling you know, the encryption or something like that. What if like you that, went right? two-factor, right? You have another uh, piece of okay, information. Okay, two-factor. I like that one better. Multi-factor. So, so the, you have to pass in the um, multi-factor authentication code as part of the authentication at the time, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, because you've changed that strategy, now any applications that were using the old authentication service now have to know to you, you know, they have to be updated at the same time and released at the same time as this new authentication service. So the deployability and the developability are both impacted by that service. Yeah, you can't just release that thing. Assuming that you don't just create a V2 of it, right, or something like that, but you can't just say, all right, well, I'm updating the authentication service because that will now bust everything else. Well, you're saying the V2, though, that means that now assumes that you have concurrently two versions of the service running. Right. That's what right? I'm saying. Let's not assume that. And yeah. And, and maybe that, that might not be an option for your particular organization, right. right? Like you might not have the option of running two versions of the service because maybe in the background, there might be like schema changes that are forced on the first version of the service. That's like, I can't, I can't allow this version anymore. Right. Maybe, that database doesn't exist that way or whatever. Maybe the way you were storing the, maybe the way you were storing the passwords uh, for example, maybe you didn't have them encrypted good enough, right? 
And so you, you've had to like force uh, maybe because of some like government regulation, like a HIPAA regulation or something like that. Like you have to absolutely, you know, do away with the old way that you were doing the password. So you've like gone and deleted from that and you know, you force all your users to change their password. They have to go through the new version of the service. So it's not an option to run the new yep. both. And I do like the having the ability with microservices to be able to spin those up, those two different versions at other times. I definitely think it's a benefit to be able to do that. And then it buys you flexibility on like how to upgrade stuff. But yeah, it may not be an option, which, and that's another point. Like if you've only got three servers or one server, you know, microservicing, it's just another, you know, it's, it's a premature optimization. Yep. And uh, we touched on some of these other things, but one of the things that they say here is service interfaces are not any more formal, rigorous, or defined than functions. And that's interesting, right? Like when you think about that, still, if it changes, everything else has to change, right? Yeah, and I've definitely been on the receiving end and the, and also the giving end of you know making changes to services. Oh, I forgot to tell you. you know, I say that's <laughs> right. not a string anymore. Oops. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I've definitely been on the receiving end of some bad documentation related to services too. Oh, man. Yep. So I would have much rather have had a function that I could go reading rather than bad documentation that leads me down the wrong road. Right. Um, they start talking about here the the independent, what, what Joe's thought of a service was, was the independent development and deployment. And they say that it's been proven that large enterprise systems can exist in the form of a monolith services based or component based doesn't really matter it can all be one right as a matter of fact there was a i want to say it might have been a software engineering daily or or software engineering radio podcast episode a while back where they had on the 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 guy who created uh base camp i think is the name of it it's a it's a ruby on rails thing and david hansel hireman and and he was like, yeah, man, ours runs as a monolith, and we have, you know, I forget how many users. It's ridiculous. I and remember you talking about this. It, yeah, it was amazing. Like the dude's like, look, man, we have a monolith, and he's like, hardware is cheap. Add more of it, right? It, trying to scale this thing out in software is going to be a super expensive engineering problem. And he's like, and ours runs fine, right? Like we we've, we've never really had a problem. So. It is interesting. It's not saying that everybody should go monolith, but it, it does make you at least step back and say. Do we need this? Need is a very important word. Yeah, I mean, it, I have been in some places where microservices were employed and it does kind of make you question, is this a micro optimization that we're making before we know that we need it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we said architecture is all about deferring those sort of implementation details and this is definitely an implementation detail. So why start there? Yeah. Okay, and I did find the link. I'll share this in the in the uh, show notes. It was Software Engineering Radio, episode 261. And his name is David Heinemeyer. And yeah, he talks yeah. And, and he talks about the state of Rails monolith monoliths and all that stuff. So it, it was a really interesting episode. He's a great person to to follow on Twitter too. He uh is not afraid of saying controversial things. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so just to round this one out, he um uh, Uncle Bob says that, you know, because these services are tightly bound to the data that they ingest or output, they are still tightly coupled to their dependencies and their deployments must still be coordinated with those external systems. Yep. Oh, now this- here's a, here's a downside that wasn't mentioned though, is that, uh, you know, if it was just a function, you have compile time checking, you know, error, right. compile time errors versus runtime errors. And we've talked about the benefits of, you know, per- prefer compile time error over runtime error. They're a whole lot easier to handle. Right. You know about them. Yeah. Uh, What's wrong with your kitty? Tell me about your kitty problem. What you got, Joe? All right. So I don't know if you guys remember way back, you know, a couple months ago, we talked about a, t- a taxi service as uh, an example of an application. And uh, you've got a user who could basically say, hey, I need a taxi. And your app would be in charge of dealing with the various companies and making sure that your uh, qualifications as a, a writer are met, like, you know, it's maybe a certain price or a certain quality of cab or some such. And uh, it would go out, find the cab and, and get it to you. And we had like a little sample app that we worked on. Well, in the meantime, in those last couple of months, marketing came back to those, those programmers and said, hey, you know what? In addition to all that other stuff, we also want to start delivering kitties around the city. And uh, because of that, we need to be 
aware of other people's allergies, particularly the drivers. Also, anyone, any cab that has delivered a kitty needs to take a couple days off before letting one ride in it just in case. And so they basically, uh, they do what PM does, right? They, um, they took things in a direction that w- w- would have been difficult to predict ahead of time. And what did that do to our functional decomposition? Somebody else. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that was the thing is all of a sudden you had this simple, you know, pick up somebody and deliver them from one place to another as a taxi service. And now you have all these additional rules like, you know, can the cat go with this person? Can the cat be taken to this location? All this kind of stuff. If all that was in some sort of microservice architecture, how much of that stuff would have to change? Probably all of it, right? Like every bit of it. So that architecture that you used, quote unquote, at the time that you created that thing originally, it doesn't support these new use cases. And so you got to redo it all anyways. Right. This is a cross-cutting concern of, uh, you know, fundamentally to how this service is going to work. What was once just a taxi service is now a, also a kitten delivery service, right? That, that's a cross-cutting concern across the, you know, that impacts the entire application. So everything is going to be affected. And you know, the funny part is, I think the last time we mentioned this, this, uh, we're going to call it a vocabulary term, which by the way, Joe Zach, didn't you create a GitHub vocabulary thing for coding blocks? Like we need to start updating this thing. Yeah. Joe requested Joe had a great idea. Um, and said, uh, basically, Hey, why don't you, uh, really does. put up some of the vocab. Yeah, he really does. Joe, you're awesome. And uh, anyway, I made a little GitHub page. It's really scant right now, but hey, uh, you could totally fork it and add stuff to it. So I'm going to add, uh, take a little note here to add cross-cutting concerns. Because I always think of like logging or something else. So it was interesting to see like a, a functional requirement considered cross, cross-cutting because it really does have effects on UI. I mean, every single layer of the diagram, we won't go over the diagram, but every single component was like, oh, yep, that needs to change because this and that needs to change because of that. Yeah, so cross-cutting concerns for anybody that's not aware. That's basically something that, that, that touches like all different parts of your application, right? It could be, we, it's easy to say logging because typically you want to log things if there's errors or, or warnings or whatever. So that's an easy one that you kind of want everywhere. Um, a lot of times there's retries and that kind of stuff. So yeah, cross-cutting concerns is a good vocabulary for anybody who's not heard of it. And functional so, decompositions. Yep. And so he says that, you know, you know, care needs to be taken so that these new features don't cut across all of your services. Yeah. So how the heck do you do that? <laughs> and I feel like that, that's kind of been what the whole book has been about. It's like, well, how do you do that? What you do is you create a bunch of interfaces to interact between these different parts of our application. And then we can sideload this jar or DLL or library or service, or whatever. And then we can inject this logic into various other places by basically configuring our current application, our current services to go through that and to incorporate the pieces as needed. So it's writing our own logic for this specific problem and then kind of configuring it into the flow and uh, utilizing tools like dependency injection and configuration management to make it all work. And by the way, this is something that is going, like we're not even going to try and describe how he broke it down and changed it in the book because like he's got pages of diagrams to where he's re-architecting, reconfiguring these boundaries and all that kind of stuff. So like this is literally one of those things that if you want to be able to follow along with this one, you'll need the book. So again, if you want your chance to win it, you know, leave a comment here, but this is, this is where having the book can add some value to, to some of these conversations. And before reading this, I was like, as soon as I heard the problem, I was like, well, you, you know, yeah, you have to change everything. And then kind of reading the explanation of how they kind of broke it out and how they kind of made it happen. It's like, oh, well, crap, that's pretty good. But I still kind of, I'm like, my mind is bog- boggling. Because if say, you know, the next day, like, hey, we're now we're a parrot delivery service too. I, I think like, okay, now we're going to need to sideload the parrot stuff. And then we're going to have to configure this stuff and kind of pile it on top of the kit. Like, how do you do that without having the, the bird stuff aware of the kitty stuff aware of the driver, you know, it's st- my mind is still kind of melting over that. Um, but I'm going to take his word for it. And that's not an easy problem. Right. And that's one of those things. Like I, I think he said, it might've been our last episode where he was talking about, don't try and guess everything up front. Right. Like yeah. if something like this comes along, yes, take a step back and look at all of it because architecture is a, an iterative approach. So don't try and figure out all this stuff to make it the most flexible system on the planet when you started out delivering people, right? 
when this next requirement comes up that kind of blows up your whole world, at that point, say, all right, well, where can I draw these boundaries? Where, where are the things that are in common? Where are the things that aren't? And then go from there. So like, you, you know, your next step, you'd probably do the same thing. You'd back up, you, you'd try and draw it out like on a sheet of paper of all things and say, hey, where can I draw these lines? Well, I think it was also mentioned too in like the last episode that those pain points, those, those, those points of friction uh, are going to be the ones that you're going to reevaluate. Right. You know, um, cause you're not going to like take a look at it, you know, all up front. You're not gonna be able to like break it apart into all of its individual granules. You'll, you'll do a little here, a little there. And you know, right. each time you, you iterate on it again, it's going to be on like, what's the next pain point. Right. And I will say like going to a real life use case of this thing, if you find yourself start writing a bunch of if else statements, we've used this in, in, in payment processing before, cause it's a pain that we've all felt. If you start seeing yourself doing if PayPal, then this, if credit card, if this, if, you know, other payment instrument than this, then you really, really need to take a step back and think about how do I abstract this better? Yeah, same with switch statements, you know, same kind of thing. Yep, switch, yeah. if else, any of that kind of stuff where you start really complicating your code and really introducing a lot of potential uh, maintenance problems and, and just bugs because you have all these if else statements, that's when you need to think about how do I break this down to where it's just something that can be plugged in, right? If you can, if you can train your mind to think of how can I plug this in and it work, then, then you've taken a step in the right direction. Well, here's something that some might consider controversial. If I remember clean code correctly, Uncle Bob said that your switch statements should only be used in factories. Yes, he did. That's the only time you're allowed to use a switch statement. Yep. So getting back onto the topic here about the cross-cutting concerns, he says that these architectural boundaries uh, don't run between the services, but rather through them. So this is kind of, you know, at first, like that, that statement, I'm like, wait, what? What does that mean? But this is kind of building on what Joe was talking about with, you know, using solid principles and interfaces between these things to, um, you know, as to like, well, how do you fix this problem, right? And that's what he's trying to get at here is that, you know, the, these interfaces are what's going to run through the different, um, you know, from the, the service and the user of the service. Yep. And we got the uh, dependency rule coming up again. It was saying that the dependencies need to point inward to uh, higher or lower layers. Depending <laughs> on the diagram you're looking at. Dang it. it, it the easiest way to remember it is your application's business logic is the innermost circle, right? So that's inward. Everything should be pointing towards that. The top of the ziggurat or the cone. Yes. <laughs> awesome diagram. Yes. See, the architecture is defined by the boundaries within the system and the dependencies that cross those boundaries. Yeah, it's not defined by the physical uh, mechanisms of how the code communicates and runs. That's, that's so important. Don't think about the underlying storage. Don't think about the communication channels. Don't think about that stuff. It's your, literally how they interact. Yeah. Your architecture, here's another one too. Like if you were to go to like a conference, uh, you know, and you were to ask somebody like, hey, what's your architecture? You know, you might often hear people refer to the tech stack. Yeah, definitely. Not the architecture. Definitely. Definitely it, feel like microservices was a common answer to for the organizations that are using microservices. Like, hey, what's your architecture? Like microservices, everything. Right. But how do you, the language? Okay. So, so backing up then, if, if somebody asks you about the architecture of your system, what do you say? Because that's typically your go-to it's a microservices or I have three tiers or whatever, like everything we've talked about in this book over the past, what, three months, it is not, it's not got anything to do with the technical nitty gritty hardware. None of that. It's literally drawing lines between, between functional components. I keep in my wallet a folded up diagram of, <laughs> of all the functionality and objects within, uh, you know, and, and so I can physically show like, here are the lines between my, this is what my architecture looks like. These little bubbles over here, they communicate through here. So, so when somebody asks you, you like, you, hold, hold, please. Right. You, you pull that wallet out, you unfold that thing, you, you uncrinkle it, lay it yes. out on the, on the floor and you're like, it Bam. takes me a little bit. It, <laughs> takes, it takes me a minute. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. <laughs> you can uh, see how like a, a database focus, focus person might generate a schema diagram when asked about the architecture. Right. I, I think what, like what he's getting at is like the answer should be like in the taxi kitty example, it should be, 
Well, um, we've got a user interface that takes input from a user and it goes out to a taxi dispatcher. And we've got a couple of rules there and it goes out and it figures out based on those rules, which uh, taxi dispatch or taxi services are eligible to send a car. We go ahead and get that scheduled for the user who pays us somehow. And we and have abstractions here and, you know, just, it's definitely more of a technical software talk than it is a, oh, we have three tiers. Right? That's pretty interesting. I almost just described the business, not the, you know, right. the actual application. And it's because those things have gotten to be like really close. And, and if we go way back, the whole purpose of software is to enable the business to automate and, and do things. Make money. A, yeah, in a computing way. It's about the business. The only value you really have is what you're adding to the business through your application. So then your short answer is, if somebody asks you what the architecture is uh, at your job, then you should either describe your business or say something short like, it, our or architecture is designed to support the business or after reading this book you just say oh we have a clean architecture <laughs> or, uh, or don't lie <laughs> well, okay. well, <laughs> I mean, i'm assuming <laughs> i'm ass- our listeners probably have clean architecture yeah, and that's what i'm do. assuming yes, you know, they that's wouldn't. why they're all listening right now yeah i mean you want to sound good so don't tell them the truth that's right but uh, you know, like an e-commerce site you might say something like well we've got a website front end where users can place orders uh through a queue that gets picked up and processed by processing and uh, then accounting does this. And I mean, you really are uh, describing the business. And just like we said, when we first started out on this journey with this book, we want the scope to max to match the structure. And what we meant by that was the actual business need and what the code looks should be like a reflection. And the closer that reflection is to being accurate to like both sides, you know, match like looking in the mirror, then the less strife there's going to be between the two and the easier it's going to be to change things. Because remember, that was the big problem. This is said we want a checkbox that, a checkbox that, you know, undoes your entire world. Well, like, well, we can't do that because that's actually a really big change for us because even though it seems like something little for you, uh, the way we've written these rules doesn't line up with the way you think about these rules. And that's what we're trying to fix with clean architecture. Hey, before we go into the resources, there was a really good, and I want to find who did it. There was a really good comment from, oh man, it was an episode discussion on this podcast and it was from, I cannot find it, doggone it, man, I hate that. At any rate, it was brought up, we we had mentioned in the last episode, this whole thing about, um, what was it? Partial decoupling or partial Partial boundaries, partial boundaries. So what we said is, you know, in a fully uh, implemented boundary, you might have your interfaces in a separate project, separate jar, separate, whatever, right. Or, or assembly that both sides that are going to use that thing will implement. Right. And the discussion was, well, if you go the partial boundary route, then you might skip breaking that thing out to its own assembly or, or jar or whatever. And then that way you don't have as many things to manage when you're deploying, right? So you might bundle it in with a particular layer, we'll say, or a particular component, I think is how it was put. And man, it it drives me crazy that I can't find them because it won't scroll back far enough right now. But the, the thing that was said was, well, why not just put it in the application layer? Because that's your most central so things can use it. And, and I wanted to reply to that because it's a really good statement. If you don't have that many layers outside of that, then maybe that's fine, right? Maybe, maybe you make things depend on that interface in there. The only problem I see with that is, and, and I tried to reply in the thing, and, I, and, and it's hard to describe this stuff, just you know, writing back about thoughts, right? But what I was saying is, if that application tier doesn't actually implement that interface, then it doesn't make sense to put it there. You know what I'm saying? So, so for instance, if you put the interface in there because you want everything to be looking in and basically anything can look in there and say, implement the interfaces in this particular application component. Well, if that application component isn't using that interface in any way, shape or form, then you're probably putting it in the wrong place because now it's just sort of a dumping ground. There's no cohesion there. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that says this application tier belongs to this interface. So I want to redefine how you described partial versus fully. Okay. Um, Because I think it might help clear this up a little bit. Okay. Is that 
from what I recall, and you tell me if, if I could be way off base, but a fully implemented boundary was where everything was in its own separate component, separate, de- separately deployed component, right? A partially one is you, it's all deployed together, but maybe in the source code, it's broken out into separate projects so that later it could be broken out into independent. Right, right. So what you're describing is like, you might still have that other project for that interface, right? And other projects that want it might reference that interface either for uh, implementing a version of that interface or just, hey, I want some ver- I want uh, an instance of this interface, you know, but um, it's not, it, it would still be in its own thing and not in some other project that has nothing to do with it. Right. And that's really the key, right? So whatever abstraction, and we say interface because it's easy to just, you know, think about things that, that polymorph to that. It, it could be an abstract class, whatever. But what I'm saying is that thing should at least be where it's being used, right? Or where, where it's being implemented because it doesn't make sense just to say, hey, put everything in the application tier just because you know everything's going to be pointed in that way, right? If there's no implementation at that level of that particular interface or that, that abstract class or whatever it is, then that's probably not the right place to put it. Bring it out to where it is being used by whatever's on both sides of it, you know? So, I, 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 Joe, I see you you're sort of looking. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was just thinking, like, by putting it in the core, then you're kind of applying that this is kind of like a core feature, a core part of the system. But if it's, you know, you've got the interface there, but the functionality is really not, it's really in one of these lower layers, and you're kind of lying to your users or you're, you're misleading. Right. And that's what I was getting at. Your core logic. Yeah, and that's, and again, I mean, it, it's easy to talk about these things and in, in hypotheticals, but you know, you'd probably see it. Like if you ever saw, you know, some sort of class that's, that's buried in your application and nothing's really using it there, then, then you probably need to figure out where that thing should actually live because you don't want to just say, Hey, we'll see innermost here, put everything here because I know everything can use it. Right. That just doesn't make sense. So. Yeah, yeah that makes sense to me. I'm on board. All right. So with that, um, if you haven't already left us a review, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. If you would puts a huge smile on our face. Uh, you can head to www.codingblocks.net slash review, and you can find some helpful links there to some of the main, uh, aggregators. But, uh, I think we've said it before, like, I don't care how many reviews we have. Every new one that I read is a smile. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I enjoy reading every one of them. So, um, you know, don't think that, uh, you know, you're too late to leave yours. It'll, it'll still mean just as much to us as the first one. Definitely. Hey, and by the way, I want to give credit where credit was due. It was not in the episode discussion channel. It was in the podcast chat and it was Henry Coggin who left that message. It was reached a lot. and I, great, great point. So thanks for, for sharing that, those thoughts in there. Which is also a great segue into like if you wait, have wait, it going to Slack. Wait, 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 wait. What were you going to say? I had another segue. All right. But <laughs> I, I was just going to say, don't forget that we're sending out free stickers if you send a review. So you don't need to go back and screenshot anything. Like we're, we're, we're doing honor system here. But if you have left a review in the past uh, we, and, and we really appreciate it, we want to send you uh, stickers. So go ahead and uh, shoot us a, a message or an email or something and we'll hook you up. Even if you're, uh, especially if you're international. Sorry. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you haven't already, um, joined the Slack community, you really should. Um, so you can hit us up there at, uh, codingblocks.net slash Slack. If, if you haven't already joined. I was actually telling Arlene earlier today that believe it or not, Slack is actually the best way to contact me because I get the little notification number, like email, definitely not Twitter, like not, eh, you know, not so much like we all kind of check it sometimes. So that those notifications kind of get lost, but uh, Slack, I will eventually see it. And I'm still not very good at that though. <laughs> but you do get a little ding on your phone, on your computer, all three of them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, email, I mean, email works too. So whatever you're com- comfortable with, you know, we're there, like go ahead and contact us about those stickers. We'll hook you up. Um, it's just, uh, I know like email too, gets a lot of spam and notifications and stuff. So Slack is preferred, but we'll hook it up. Definitely. All right. 
so uh, let's get into my favorite portion of the episode. Survey says <laughs> outlaw family step on up. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I would try to sing the music right now, but it would come out horribly wrong. <laughs> Okay, there, I did it for you. Hey, we haven't sang in a while, so no, I'm glad you did that. It, with the creepy host, although now it's Steve Harvey, so that's not so much creepy as just hilarious. Yeah, yeah right. He's kind of mean, isn't he? Man, don't be the person. Have you seen that's... some of the people on there, though? <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> mommy. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, that was different than mommy. Um, okay, so... I mentioned earlier that there was uh, you know, some similarity between our recent survey and some other sites' recent survey. And last episode, we asked, when you're not coding for work or school, in your free time, do you eat, sleep, code, repeat? Coding is all that matters. Or you got to be well-rounded. Get outside, ride a bike, climb a mountain, hike a trail. Or Netflix, got to binge watch everything. Or Rocket League. Or insert favorite video game title here. I feel like that should have been Call of Duty. Seeing as how that's what we used to talk about all the time. Used to be, man. Times have changed, haven't they? No, man. I love some Call of Duty now. Really? Man, on Xbox One. I used to love it, man. God, I I don't even know what happened. Like, somehow it just... I, it was literally like a light switch, like years of Call of Duty, and just finally I was like, oh, I'm done. Well, that was me last year. Last year I didn't play it, and then this year I just I had the itch, and I was like, I, I, I need this in my life. <laughs> so, and the Overwatch <laughs> came out, and I was like, oh, this is different and new and also good. Like, what else is out there? Yep. I did see that um, they're, they already have announced the pre-order for Black Ops 4, and I did get a little excited <laughs> when I saw that. I can't lie. I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> so I don't know, man. All right, sorry for derailing us. All, All right, right back to so the um, let's go Joe first. Which one do you think is the most popular? Coding uh, matters, get outside, Netflix, or Rocket League? This is tough. Um, if it was, it was a multi-select, it would definitely be Netflix because like everybody has Netflix, right? I would say you know, a, a large percentage of people. And uh, uh, geez, this is tough. I'm going to say Netflix with uh, 37%. Wow, you went high. Nice. I did. I think I'm going low on this one. I'm going to go, man, this one is hard because honestly, I could see every one of these being like 25% of the the vote. Uh I'm going to go Rocket League because I think we got some gamers. Yeah. I want to say Rocket League and we're not talking about the percentage of time they do doing this. We're just talking about the percentage of people. You have free time (laughs) and this is your go-to way to spend that free time. I'm going to give this 20%. 20% Rocket League. Okay, well done. All right. 20% 20% Rocket League and 37% Netflix and survey says you're both wrong. Oh, man. Wow, don't, okay. People are lying. They said they get outside. I don't believe it. Yep. That's get outside bad. is the number one answer with 43% of the vote. Man, that's 43. awesome. I, yep. that's, I would have never guessed that high, and I think that's awesome. That's what I'd hoped everybody would say. Yep. Now, you, you had number two, Alan. Okay. Rocket League or, or any kind of gaming was definitely, uh, you know, 20%. That was number two. How, followed by, how far was it, though? Was it truly 20? Uh, no, it was like almost 21. Yeah. Oh, I was really close. Yeah. How about that? All right. Yeah. Had that been the most popular answer, you would have definitely won by prices, right? Rules. Nice. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, Netflix was actually last. Wow. Last place, yeah. I would have said Rocket League, but my subs keep getting destroyed in Subnautica. So I got to get back to it. Glanks uh, hooked me up. He threw out a little time capsule, so I got to go find it. But yeah, I'm always putting around with something. Yeah, awesome. I mean, it was, it was kind of interesting comparing our, our results with the Stack Overflow results because they, they worded theirs as like, well, how often do you exercise, right? They didn't, they didn't give it a choice of like, hey, do you exercise or do you just Netflix or Rocket League or, right. you know, because basically like, Eat, sleep, code, repeat, Netflix and Rocket League, for example, could all be done in front of your computer. Yep. In fact, you could do those maybe even somewhat concurrently. <laughs> I don't know about all three of them. Definitely, there's definitely two of them you could definitely do. Yeah. Um, but uh, so theirs was just how often do you exercise, period. And the, the choices were, uh, I don't typically exercise one to two times a week, 
three to four times a week or daily or almost daily. Care to take a stab at what you think those were? Two to three. Two to three? It, wait, no, that wasn't a choice. It was one to two or three to four. Mm, one to two. One to two is the number one? Yeah. Care to put a percent on it? 27. 27. Joe? One to two, uh, 60%. 60% one to two. <laughs> no way. No. I don't typically exercise was 37.4%. Ouch. Percent. One to two was the number two choice at 29. Man, I'm really close. Yeah. Yeah. So I will say for me, like this, these answers here, it's cyclic. Like I'll literally find yeah. myself for weeks at a time. I, all I do is code all day. Right. Yeah. And then I'll be like, I got to get out and I got to get some exercise. I need some physical exertion, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean, and then there's times where I need some Call of Duty in my life, right? It's just, yeah. I would yeah. say that exercise is probably a little extra hot this time of year. Yeah. Right? We're still coming off that January 1st. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, if you take a look at like, you know, we had uh, 43% were saying they get outside when they have their free time. If you take all of the ones from Stack Overflow, all the all of the exercise ones and combine them in to one choice of like you know do you exercise or not then it was like 60 percent of oh. the respondents exercise at least weekly interesting right that's cool i mean it's good to hear because it's i mean honestly in this profession if you don't get some phys- physical exercise in your life you will eventually just get to a point where you feel bleh and and i mean you know. sitting is the news is the smoking that's of our generation yep. right Yep. So you you know, know, I finally had my first full standing day because oh, I had nice. meetings all day. <laughs> so that wasn't so nice, but it was nice that I sit all day and I, I wasn't uncomfortable. So when I first started standing, even after like two hours, I remember being like, oh my gosh, I'm standing two hours a day. My feet hurt. Yeah. So now like I can do a whole day and it's no big deal. Awesome. Man, I, I got to get me a, a standing desk. How often do you use yours? Not as much as I should, probably a few times a month. I mean, oh, I, really? I'm not good about it. Yeah, Only a few times a month? Yeah, I'm not. I, I should be. The thing is, I, I'll get coding and I'll just forget that I even have it. All right? Oh, right. And, and it's just. I could see that. Yeah. So. The uh, meeting's great because I don't like typing a lot while I'm standing. But in the meeting, like no problem standing. I don't have to be like dance and stuff to kind of keep awake. Yeah. It's good. Nobody even knows I'm dancing right now. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> all right so this episode we're gonna ask we, we while we watch joe dance raise the roof that's right we uh <laughs> oh man we gotta have the sprinkler next, if you're right? not watching this also on video you should because <laughs> the dance moves that i'm seeing right now are just amazing and you owe it to yourself to check it out. Uh, I've like seen sprout into a, a flower or something before. <laughs> head, head to codingblocks.net slash YouTube uh, to get to our YouTube channel. Yep. And uh, you'll, you'll be able to find this in all of its video glory. I do a lot of dancing on <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> so uh, we talked about licenses before earlier, and I forget the exact context of it. Um, Uh, Something, one of the things that you brought up earlier, I think in the beginning of the show, Alan, but so this episode, we're going to ask, do you pay attention to third party licenses? And your answer, your choices are (laughs) your answers. I was going to answer it for you, but instead I digress and I'll just give you your choices. Your first, your first choice is yes, because my company forces me to, or yes, because it's a good habit or no, wait, you actually read those things? Or lastly, no, wait, am I supposed to? Yeah, this will, this will be interesting. Uh, I, I bet there will be things in here that will be scary. Yeah, I think it, it depends a lot on like where you work like, work, like what kind of software. All right, so coming back in here, the next thing that we're going to talk about are test boundaries. And yes, they are a part of your architecture. That's the tests, right? The tests are a part of your architecture. The tests are, yes. They, they should not be an afterthought, basically, right? It, we talked about it in clean code and other things. They need to be there. And here's the interesting thing, right? Like we've talked about all these abstractions and everything. That's not the case with tests. They need to be very detailed and very <laughs> concrete. They are following the same dependency rule that everything else is, and they're pointing inwards. Yeah, and, uh, 
Oops. Dang it. All right. Oh, okay. I think we're probably going to say the same thing. The tests are not immune to all the rules we've been talking about. They're not some like sort of side thing where you get to do whatever you want. It's really important to write those well or else they end up being fragile and discarded. Yeah, except I, w- I did want to come back in and explore on that though. But um, he said one part here that I hadn't really thought about it. Like he says, like, think of your, your tests as your outermost circle, right? And I'd never really thought of them like that, but and it makes sense when you, when you do. And if I remember right, when they fall into the zone of uh, uselessness or something, it's something ridiculous. It might not have been uselessness, but basically. Zone of pain, maybe? Zone of pain. They are very concrete and very not abstract, and that's what it was, zone of pain. So, yeah, I mean, but that's the way they're supposed to be, right? They're supposed to be there to test what you have. Yeah, they're consumers of your code. Right, not be used by anything else. Right, and I'll remember the dependency rule means the dependencies go inward. So the test still shouldn't be dependent on, say, a database. So, you know, of course, if you do an integration test or something, then you're, you're going to end up testing some sort of database or some sort of mock of one. But yeah, just the idea that tests are uh, part of that boundary and they're part of that layer that are outside and past all of that because they can kind of reach in. And um, that made me kind of think about a, a discussion that we had way, way back, maybe like episode nine, way in the beginning, we were talking about unit testing. When we talked about testing internal, classes and methods or, or package or private or basically, you know, some sort of non-public entity with unit tests. And we both said, I think Outlaw and I both said, I don't remember where you were at, Alan, but we both liked that idea. And we kind of struggled with the notion that maybe you shouldn't test, you know, anything but the public layer. I was wondering, uh, like, how you thought about that now, Outlaw, that we've kind of, like, read this chapter. Well, I mean, this chapter was, like, you might think that, okay, you might think that hearing us talk about test boundaries, you're like, oh God, not this again. I've seen so many take talks on unit, talk, unit testing and TDD and BDD, blah, blah, blah. You're like, okay, I'm done. I don't need this. But this chapter was actually like seriously eye-opening. It made me like reconsider everything that I've ever done about uh, unit testing was probably wrong. And it actually like flies in the face of a lot of the – like how you should structure your unit tests kind of topics and conversations that are out there. Um, So, you know, I would say that uncle Bob would definitely argue that you shouldn't be going after, you know, anything that's not public, that you should only be testing the public layer. Um, And that makes sense. But the reason why I say that it, it was so mind blowing for me was that, you know, you mentioned earlier a moment ago, Alan, about them being in the zone of pain because they are so concrete and fragile, right? Um, he refers to it as like, you need to create a testing, a test API, right? And I think we've talked about this in the content, in some other context before where it was like a test language, right? If I remember right. But he, he basically says like, your, your testing architecture needs to have its own API that's a that's a superset of these interfaces so that you can decouple your tests from the application themselves so that testing you know refactoring the application doesn't mean necessarily mean that the tests themselves have to be rewritten yeah that was a really cool takeaway and i've never thought of it like that like i you know even um i think when we've talked about uh you know unit testing before and in fact, I think there was a previous episode where I had posted like, hey, here's how, you know, I like this. Uh, there was this article that Phil Hack put out about like how he likes to structure his unit tests and so that it shows up nice inside of that IDE. And then uh, Roy uh, Osharov, I think is how you pronounce his name, that wrote uh, The Art of Unit Testing. He had a particular format on how to structure your unit tests and even, you know, as far as from the naming perspective so that, you know, regardless of what test runner you used, you could immediately see what class was being tested, what method was being tested and what use case was being tested. Right. And, you know, I, and in that episode uh, where I, you know, merged those two concepts into one, it was like, Hey, here's how I like to do it. Right. Would totally go against everything that uncle Bob is telling us here. Because 
you know, having those class names and those method names in the unit test names and the unit test method names, he would, he would probably want to slap me with this book if he saw that. Because they call this the fragile test problem. Basically, as those, those um, concrete classes change, you could have, like, depending on how complex your project is, you could have a thousand unit tests fail. Right? And it's like, whoa. Yeah, it's, it's really funny. Like, reading this chapter, I felt like I kind of had, like, Uncle Bob on one shoulder and, like, Roy Ostro over on the other. And, uh, you know, I, as soon as I would start, like, leaning one way, the other would kind of smack me. And so, I, you know, my initial first thoughts coming in were, well, of course, my test files should match, you know, match up like one for one for the, the test fi- or the files that are under test, right? And um, same with the assemblies and everything. It should all just line up because I'm testing classes, right? I'm testing these smallest units. And then, you know, reading this chapter, I, I've got, uh, you know, it feels like Uncle Bob slapped me on the back of the head saying, hey, wait, no, this is the outermost consumer. Like, why would you cheat and suddenly start having all these concrete dependencies and, uh, you know, like, why would, you, why would you do that? And that's totally anti everything. Are you trying to make this stuff really fragile? Like, why would you have it totally this mirror image of everything that's under test so that you, you know, like kind of by definition, every time you change one, you have to go change the other. Like, are you crazy? So every time I would kind of start leaning towards one, I would get smacked to the other. So I still, I don't, I don't know where I ended up. I'm still <laughs> forgetting that out. Yeah, honestly, I, I'm with you on that. Yeah, I, I still got to try to like sort this out in my mind now because it was a little bit of like a mind blown moment. Like I've had so many years of, you know, extremely smart, well-respected people in the developer community. Uh, you know, we named it, we named a couple already that are, you know, saying like, hey, here's some like really good ways to structure your tests and everything and like good patterns. And then this comes along and I'm like, Oh man. And it's not just I incorporate that. Right. It's not that it just comes along and you're like, Oh, it makes sense. Right. Like, yeah, that made sense. Exactly. as like how Joe put it, you know, like you're, why would you cheat? This is the outermost circle. So why would you suddenly decide that it's okay to cheat the system here? Yep. And and if you, if you go back to what we talked about, I think on the last episode when we thought we were going to have both of them in one, we talked about the main, program the main method right being the thing that that scaffolds it or or puts all the things together right that's basically what your unit test should do right there should be some some things that new up everything and, and inject all your dependencies in the first place and you use the abstractions and, and now you're in a spot to where if you want to test it slightly different if you have another pluggable feature guess what you just test that way too and it's funny, just the other day on Twitter, I saw someone talking about how they gave some advice for, for somebody on, on unit testing and they pasted like the, the, what they typed to the person in Twitter. And I read it and I was like, oh, this person is going to get a beat down. Like they, they don't know the rules and what you're supposed to say about unit testing because they were advocating <laughs> for outside in unit testing. And I thought maybe they had just come up with this or this was just kind of like a novel idea that they had. And I was like, oh boy, here, you're going to get it, right? And grab the popcorn <laughs> and I hit the replies. And man, reply after reply after reply was like, man, I finally get it. This actually makes so much more sense to me. I'm actually testing this stuff, how I use it. It's not so fragile. It's really great. And I started kind of Googling this whole outside in and saw that there's, there's a, a little bit of talk. I don't know if I'm maybe not getting the right terminology or, you know, what it is. So I'm not finding like kind of people recently talking about it. But I do see this term of outside in testing, you know, sprinkled throughout blog posts over like the last five years or so. But now I'm kind of wondering, it's like, well, crap, you know, maybe I need to like reevaluate and look at some of like the newer thinking on unit tests and, you know, maybe I've been kind of stuck in my ways. I don't, I don't know. It's easy to do. We've talked about it. We did the same thing with databases for years, right? Like it was your source of truth. It was the core. It was what everything depended on only to look back and go, Oh, wait a second. That really shouldn't have mattered. Right. Yep. So, uh, and we kind of skipped over it. These should be independently deployable, right. And the most isolated system component meaning that it, 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 it really only relies on everything else. Nothing should be touching that. So you can push it out there and it'll run at any time. And they, they, and they already are deployed like that. They already are independently deployed. If you think about it, you don't deploy the test version of your code to a production app, environment. Right. You know, typically that's a debug version that's just deployed to whatever you're going to run the tests are. Uh, you know, even if that quote deployment is just locally on your own file system, 
but that's it. Well, let's talk about that real quick. It depends on what language you're talking about, right? Because if you talk about something like C Sharp, that'll be in a separate project that you don't deploy, right? If you're talking about things like, uh, for instance, in the JavaScript world, it is typically a best practice to have your, your test spec in the same folder as the files that it's using. But you'll have something in the bundling or the, or the building of your application that will say, hey, skip all the spec files or, or whatever. So it's, it depends on which world you're talking about, right? Like it still doesn't get deployed. Well, that's what I meant by the deployed even like on your local file system, right? Okay. It would be like, you know, if you're skipping the, the spec files right. versus if you're building a separate DLL or jar file. It is interesting because like in the C-sharp world, it does kind of frustrate me that you can't put the test next to it. Like you have to put it in another project. And now it's not really clear to see, hey, did I test these things, right? Like is- Are there tests for this Are thing? there tests? Like there might not be. And, and that's the one thing I really do like about the, at least the, the JavaScript uh, ecosystem and how that stuff evolves is like, it's nothing to put it right next to it. It's yeah. just, you know, another, another statement in whatever your build uh, setup is to say, hey, skip these things. So, yeah. Yeah, I always thought it'd be neat to have the tests in the files too. Like, you know, I don't, I don't do that. I know that's, you know, against the rules or whatever. But uh, just imagine the idea of like, you know, going into your class and you see, you know, your one or two methods there and then you scroll down a little bit and then there's like 10 tests that kind of show you like what the, you know, the rules are, what, what it means. I bet you could do directive things. It's especially a hassle in like large yeah. projects. Yeah where there's a lot of individual um, par- components or projects within the overall solution. You know, how frustrating is like when you would have like two files open, they're, you know, the same file name basically are very similar except for maybe the word test in them. And they're even arranged kind of similarly. And like one's way over here, one's way over there. So you're like, okay, let me open the next file. And let me go up, down, over, left, turn around three times, open the other file. Uh, turn turn the other way three times, go right, go down, go up, you know, and then find the same file that's kind of mapped there and then open that up. And now you, like every time you open a file, you've got two files opening up with very similar names. You know, it's just annoying. I felt like he was trying to hunt the wumpus as he was trying to <laughs> find files. I mean, the, the interesting thing with that uh, is, is the fact that they get very disorganized unless you were super yeah, you know, hyper aware of what the file structure is, but then it sucks, right? Like if you move your class from one place to another, you're going to go move your unit test from one location to another. And so it's just, it's a mess, but. Anyway. Yeah. Wasn't that a benefit of unit testing? Like isn't it supposed to free me up to refactor more freely? Right. And now we're saying like, well, actually it's a big pain in the butt if you move anything. So, you know, well, refactor, but just don't rename anything. Yeah. But unlike, unlike the other parts of your, of the code though, in your application, your tests support development and that's it. Right. Everything else is about operation, but tests, te- your unit tests are not, they're not, they have nothing to do with operation. They're purely about supporting the development and giving you the, the confidence to do any kind of refactoring or to know that this works the way I intended it to work. This yeah, so now I'm wondering like me, you know, maybe all this time, like I thought unit testing was just really hard to do. Maybe I've just been doing it wrong. So I'm going to have to do some experimenting. I'm going to have to try um, kind of creating my own test boundary, keeping it as part of the, the architecture and, and just kind of see how that works on a project and see how I feel about it. I mean, yeah. it doesn't sound like a bad thing. No, if anything, it'll make it easier and better going forward. Right. Although it's going to be painful. It's a, it's a mind bender. Right. But um, yeah. So he has a statement here where, you know, if you think about what we said so far about, you know, these are the most detailed and concrete, they're the outermost circle. Uh, nothing depends on them. Nothing depends on them. That's a key. And that, you know, they support the development. He says all code should be modeled like the tests. Isn't that crazy? You know, layers upon layers. I mean, I, I have to see what this looks like. I've never seen anything like this. So um, if there's an open source project or something that's got like a, this kind of test layer, then I'd love to see it. And you're coming up in the next chapter. I think we've got a, a nice example of what layers like this could look like, though not specific to testing. Yep. Um, but yeah, I want to see a test layer. Yeah. So ultimately, this kind of goes back to like a TDD conversation, where you know the solution to this test boundary is to design for testability from the start, right? Which is very TDD in in thought, right? Like if you can't write a test for it, then you can't be writing the code for it either. 
And, and their next statement is something that we hit on several chapters back, which is don't depend on the volatile things. Mm-hmm. So your databases, your file storage, that kind of stuff. Like that's not things you should depend the on. The clock. The clock, right. You should, you should mock those things as much as possible. And then that way, you know, you don't have these things that are so brittle. And yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So rather than writing, okay. So going back to like my mind being blown here, you know, typically the way I would have thought about like writing unit tests would be like, okay, I have this set of classes. I need to write, you know, as Joe put it, like there's this one-to-one mapping, you know, for the, uh, the classes and then the unit tests to make sure that all the functionality in that class is tested. Right. And basically what uncle Bob was saying here is like, rather than writing these unit tests against all of the production classes. Instead, write your tests against the API, allowing this primary application to change without worrying about breaking that many unit tests because you're not necessarily going after any individual one class necessarily, but but more the overall function of some purpose. And this whole API thing is basically coding to the contract is really all he's saying, right? Code against the abstraction, whatever, whatever public interface was made and not to the class because then, then the class can change and you don't care about it. As long as that class is fulfilling whatever that contract said it had to, you don't care what the implementation was. Well, kind of going backwards to what we were, you know, our conversation at the start where we were talking about the, um, micros, the, authentication microservice, right? So you might have some code within that service that handles um, the uh, decryption or encryption, you know, well, I guess you would be doing a... Um, well, I think where you're going with it, this... Let's uh, say if you were to, if this authentication was to create, if, the, if this microservice was to, cre- to save these credentials, right, then you might want to do the initial encryption uh, and salting, right? And you wanted to make sure that like, you were producing the same, you know, given the same, uh, you know, inputs that you were always producing a consistent output, right? So you might be tempted to just test that one thing, right, in isolation and say like, hey, does this encryption layer work the way I think it does? And what he's saying here is that rather than even bothering with that low level detail, instead you would just focus on like writing a test that's about the API of like, hey, if I try to save a credential, does it get saved? Right. Period. Did it work? Right. Does does the overall intent of the thing work and not focus on the minutia of it? Which is interesting because you hear a lot about people saying code coverage, right? And it and it's a and it's a thing even in tools that will mm-hmm. measure how much code coverage you've got with your test. And this flies in the face of that too. This is no, just test against what your interfaces or your contracts say that you need to. Well, not I don't know that would necessarily word it that way because you could still have code coverage that goes across all of the intent of it without necessarily writing classes that focus in on a particular thing, right? So you could still focus in on like, you still have a test that's like, hey, did, you know, I, I called my uh, authentication service to you know, create these credentials, right? And to save those credentials and did that work? Okay, fine. And part of that path may still include um, you know, encrypting the password with some salt, right? And making sure that that works rather than having a class, a test class specifically for, hey, encrypt this and make sure that it, the output is right. So, but, I mean, it's still the same coverage. But isn't code coverage, doesn't that usually count how many methods have not been tested against? And that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, like, but you could still be calling all of those methods just, but but not specifically, not you're getting them implicit rather than explicitly calling them. Well, you could also configure the coverage tool. So you say, here are my unit tests and only calculate the coverage for this like public API layer. Okay. You've got a separate layer for it. So now we tell it to kind of ignore the other stuff because we say like, well, it doesn't really matter. That's just how the sausage is. Implementation made. details, right. Yeah, nobody cares about how the sauce is made. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this still, I'm still chewing on this chapter. <laughs> yeah, honestly, that's a good way to put it. You know, he says that this testing API should have superpowers outside the normal powers of a regular system user. Therefore, it's probably best if it's deployed separately and never ships with your product. I love this one, by the way, because what they're saying is in your test, you're bypassing everything. 
you can assume that you've got super user rights. You can assume that you don't have any rights. You can assume whatever. You mock all that stuff out, mm-hmm. right? So you definitely don't want to ship this code because now you could be potentially giving away the keys to the castle with some sort of hole, right? And, and it's interesting. It, it makes a lot of sense. You shouldn't be, if you run on a Windows network, you shouldn't be relying on AD in your unit tests, right? you should be able to mock that user out to say that, yeah, you're a member of X, Y, and Z group and you've got God rights to everything. So I, I really like this one. It, it was an interesting take on it that I don't know I've seen embraced anywhere. Yeah. Basically what I want is after having read this book, I want uh, Roy Osharov to write the art of unit testing 2.0 as it relates to the testing API that uncle Bob is suggesting here. Uh, and then maybe I'll be able to wrap my head around it more easily. I think you can write that book. You just call it the art of unit testing with good architecture. I think that's a, uh, that's a with, good title. With good, not clean, good, but with, good. With good architecture. Yeah. We don't want to see anybody's title. Right. Right. Just the first one. <laughs> <laughs> this chapter sort of came on a disclaimer, like we'll rock your world. Yes. We'll, we'll hurt your brain. All right. So now we get into something that I don't think any of us have a ton of experience in. I, I may be, I may be wrong. I think outlaw, you're probably the closest. I don't well, know. I would have said no until I kind of read <laughs> some of the uh, generating SQL type stuff. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. yeah, totally. That's a good point. Yeah. So the, the name of this one was clean embedded systems. So man, the, it's funny when I, when I first read the, the title to this particular chapter, I was like, ah, eh. And then I started reading, and I was like, okay, well, this is way more applicable than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Um, so, like, the first one, it, I love this statement that he makes. Software doesn't wear out, but it can be destroyed by unmanaged dependencies on firmware or hardware. And you're about to, and I'll let one of these guys get into it, you're about to get your head twisted around a little bit on what he means by firmware. Mm-hmm. I had to look it up. Like, I, I feel like I've used the word firmware for routers and all sorts of stuff. But like when you kept like talking about the differences between hardware and firmware, I had to go look it up. And what he means by firmware is, um, I lost, I lost the definition. This is very next line. Here you go. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, no, that's not what I was looking for. Someone else has to say it. I lost okay, well, I'll say this part then. He, he says that firmware isn't firm because of where it is stored. Rather, what it depends on and how hard it is to change as the hardware changes. Okay. And I actually, I found the line I was looking for. And so I was like, well, what the heck is firmware to begin with? And uh, what I ended up finding in Wikipedia is that they call it the low level control for the device's specific hardware. So an example here might be um, some sort of uh, call to blink the power light. Right. So it's the things like that, that can be controlled via, I don't want to say software because it's kind of in between software and hardware, right? So it's on read only memory generally, not necessarily, but uh, for the most part, this is software that isn't going to change so much. All right. So here's the part that kind of drove it all home. And and this is, (laughs) this is where if you hear this and it doesn't make you twitch a little bit, then maybe you've been doing things great all these years. But this one, this is where I was like, okay, we're not just talking about embedded systems on a chip. Non-embedded developers also create firmware when they embed SQL statements in your code. That's so true. Same type thing if you're embedding HTML in your SQL mm-hmm. when you're returning stuff. Same type thing. You are, you are making hard, fast decisions on what your architecture, or not your architecture, on what your hardware, what your application is using and what it's doing. You've now basically created firmware because it is extremely hard to pivot off that. If you're entrenching yourself, um, depending on the software itself, you could be uh, limiting yourself to particular hardware, as you mentioned, like ARM or you know whatever other kinds of hardware there is. <laughs> but also your operating system, um, your tech stack, all sorts of stuff. You're cementing yeah. your position. Yep. Yeah, I was going to embellish this a little bit because it doesn't just have to be like embedding your SQL statements. Right. We, you know, we've talked about this as... Um, you know, if you aren't careful and don't abstract away some of those dependencies, then you further tie yourself or marry yourself to them. So, for example, if uh, in your code, it's, you know, like a quote known thing by um, some kind of dependency there that you're using SQL Server, for example. Well, you've now, uh, you know, it's become firmware because it's now hardened to SQL Server, right? Yep. 
And we've talked about entity framework. If you, if you use entity framework with a link to SQL, guess what? You've now, it, and we are not picking on any framework. We both, we all know and have loved and used entity framework, but if you don't draw those boundaries properly, then you have created firmware because you have tightly coupled your application to SQL server via the entity framework, you know, bus, we'll call it. So it, it's it's really interesting when you think about it like this. That statement of software doesn't wear out. I mean, think about it. It can't. It's ones and zeros. It doesn't wear out, but it can completely be destroyed. And that's man, that's that's powerful. Mm-hmm. And um, Kent Beck, um, famous for a lot of unit testing, writing, and a lot of other stuff, um, had some really nice rules here that I think a lot of developers um, follow to some extent. And the first one was uh, first get it working. I've definitely been there where like the first thing you're just trying to do is get something to show on screen that looks roughly like, you know, some, some approximation of what you're supposed to do. Then you try to make it right. That's step two. And then after that, you try to make it fast. And a lot of developers will just kind of stop after number two or sometimes number three, but there's no keep it clean step here. Right. And that's true. The make it right doesn't mean make it, make it clean. Doesn't mean make those boundaries. It just means. <laughs> Okay, it's not as crapified as it was initially, right? Right, and yeah, and yeah, I guess you could define right to be different things, right? You could say right does mean clean, I, I suppose. Um, I just kind of interpreted it as you know actually correct, but maybe I'm wrong there. Well, and nowhere in here does it say to make it perfect. Like we're not talking about perfection. No, no, and you should. I mean, this is probably a bad thing to say. You should never strive for perfection in your code. And the only reason I say that is chances are it's going to change tomorrow or the next day or the next day. Like, I mean, we've all done it. We've created code that we're super proud of. And then it's like, Oh man, I didn't think about this edge case. And then, and then you go in and, and it's not as pretty as it was before. So don't strive for perfection, strive for really good. Like don't ever, don't ever walk away from a steaming pile and be like, that's it. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> you know? But, but you know, perfection is, is a, uh, is a tough one. And, and, programming yeah, yeah i've got a when to call when yeah exactly yeah. remember we talked about the gold plating uh, anti-pattern uh, oh, but yeah. i i do want to go ahead and make a retraction on a statement made about uh, two minutes ago <laughs> so first make it work second make it right i think to make it right does imply um getting getting it clean and, and making sure that the things are maintainable and then the third making it fast like I, you know, I, I made the statement that uh, there was no fourth step, but I think that was implicit there in step two. All right, then. Yeah, he says that if you're only going to focus on making it work, then you're doing everyone a disservice. Totally agree. Because you're going to have to maintain that thing. And there is more to software development than just making it work. That's actually where it, you can draw the line between a good developer and somebody is just getting paid to get the job done, honestly. So going back to a conversation we've had in the past about what's the difference between a junior and senior? That's a big one. That's the a big junior one. would just make it work? Yep. I got it done. Whoa, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Did you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, All right. So uh, where were we at here? So so there's much more getting it to just work. Okay. So intermingling your software and your firmware is an anti-pattern. So what does that mean? And by the way, I pretty much hate the term anti-pattern, but it has relevance because I, I feel like some people just use the words to, to make it sound cool. Right? Oh, that's an anti-pattern. Well, okay. <laughs> right? I think it was bad habits. It's a bad habit, right? Yes. So so the, the where I got kind of confused on this though was that like, well, if you intermingle the software and the firmware, then it's it's not it's no longer intermingling the firmware is a virus <laughs> if if your software is it intermingles with the firmware then the software has become firm yep the firmware has infected it and it's become firmware that's a good point yeah. it's no longer soft so there is no such thing as intermingling software and firmware that's, so, that's awesome. What we need to do here is create a humble layer that will do all the talking to the uh, the firmware, and then we can sit on top of that humble layer, and now we're protected from that virus, and we'll be able to use this code more, you know, more 
well, yeah, potentially other places and be able to test it and do all sorts of other good stuff with it. Nice, nice way to bring back in the uh, humble layer. That, that yep. Was, yep, never forget, humble objects. Oh, <laughs> never forget. <laughs> so yeah, interming, intermingled or let's say infected code resists changes. Mm-hmm. I, I actually like the infection because that's really, if you, if you, if you picture that, that's beautiful. Um, and, and the worst are these make the entire system almost impossible to test, right? Or the changes are dangerous and require full reg- regression tests. Which is so, going to make it even more difficult. If yeah. you start embedding your, your dependencies, now you've got integration tests instead of unit mm-hmm. tests, which we've talked about in the past, are really hard to do. So, and it yeah. also makes it really slow to work on, too. Like, uh, yeah, I've talked to people who work at uh, New Cash Register, uh, NCR. And, you know, obviously it's not like this because it would be too slow to work on, but I've kind of joked about like every time you, you make a code change, you got to publish to the ATM machine <laughs> they've got sitting next to your desk and then you've got to get out your debit card and, and work on And, you know, obviously that's a silly way to work because it's just too slow. But, uh, you know, a lot of us do kind of put up with that sort of stuff in other situations where we're relying on that hardware, that website, that whatever, we really bring up the website, click, 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 wait, 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 click, click didn't work start over again so we're introducing these cycles that are dependent on the bottleneck and uh that's because we don't have these kind of good uh abstractions good boundaries and good layers that we can kind of mock and play with in order to test more granularly yep it's funny you bring them up as an example i've actually been in their labs before oh really they really do have a room of all the various uh atms at some point you kind of got to right you can't just say like works on my machine (laughs) You know, roll it out to Bank of America. Now, in fairness, for what he's saying, you want to write your software in a way that it's abstracted away from the hardware so that you can write your your software independently of the hardware, but it's not a bad idea to test it on the right. hardware afterwards, right? So yeah. we're not saying that you shouldn't have it. We're just saying that it should be done in a way that you can, that you don't have that bottleneck. Yeah, you don't want to publish to that ATM because you're trying to get the uh, login, you know, the pin screen to be pixel perfect or something, right? It's just too slow. Right. So this is where the how comes in. It's the boundary between the software and the firmware. And so immediately you should think Space Odyssey 2001, uh, you know, the how 2000. The how is the hardware abstraction layer. Uh, And this is where you abstract that hardware so that your firmware can be tested off hardware. Right. So you're making a firmware a little less firm. That's That's the objective here. It provides the service without revealing how. Yeah. And an example here I, like, I really liked is that you might have methods like indicate low battery or indicate error rather than lead blink, uh, LED blink five or LED blink three, which I'm sure you at one point had some sort of hardware device where, you know, the different blinkings or maybe the different lights meant different things. Like why have that kind of blinking light code, you know, invade your code and poison your code? When you can have a a layer here that you can use to interact between. And then if you need to move this code, give it a life outside of this device, maybe the device is upgraded or, um, you know, something else changes, then it's really easy to see exactly what needs to change in order to support that new hardware. So if you're on board with the concept then of the hardware abstraction layer, then this is where things get like rinse and repeat type of patterns. Again, every time the, the goal is to make the firmware a little less firm. And so you'll bring in a a processor abstraction layer where you're trying to further decouple that, that firmware and the hardware from uh, so that, you know, you want to, you don't, you don't want anything to know about the hardware registers, for example. Um, And again, you're just trying to, your goal here is to be able to test off hardware as much as possible. And, you know, take that a step further to our operating system abstraction layer so that, uh, you know, the OS can just be treated as a detail to protect yourself against from any dependencies that you have on it, right? So you're just, you, you keep putting these abstraction layers between your, your firmware and ultimately the hardware. I mean, if you think about it, that's kind of what they probably did with the uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, right? They just stuck an abstraction in there and said, hey, and treat this just like you would a Linux system. We, we don't care about the underlying architecture. Just make it fit, right? Here, here's the interface. Let's make this work like it. Well, yeah, now PowerShell. Yeah, Say again. 
Oh, uh, PowerShell now can it can be uh, run on multiple different platforms as well, cross platform. So same type of thing. I forget where they have it, but they basically have a you know a, a abstraction layer now that sits on top of the operating system, and everything runs through that, and it just works magically. Awesome. Um, so that was PAL and the same thing for operating system OSAL, but um, either way, access layer. Yep. And uh, yeah, we've said layers many, many times tonight and uh, many times throughout the book. Uh, layer architecture is premised on the idea of programming to interfaces. It lets you do cool stuff like work vertically or horizontally or test your APIs or um, kind of slice stuff off and uh, support multiple devices for embedded architecture. Um, so it just seems like a really good idea. I mean, you can even use the layers for the, the testing, which still, you know, wrapping my, my mind around, but it definitely seems like uh, the layers have been really core layers and dependency injection have been core to the whole concept of clean architecture. Yeah. He, he wrapped this up in a different way instead of saying dependency injection, but substitutability. Right. Like, like by programming that. to the interfaces that you allow for substitutability. Which is the same thing as the whole plug-in notion and all that, right? Mm -hmm. Literally being able to swap things in and out. Yep. So, you know, a clean embedded architectures software is testable off of the target hardware, off of the target operating system, and within layers because it, the modules interface through interfaces. Yep. Interface inception. Someone had to say it. I'm sorry. And this is funny right here. They even say the if def. So uh, your, what are they called? Uh, Pound of fines. Or, yeah, your directives. Yeah. Your, like your processor Macros. directives and that kind of stuff. They violate the dry principle when you have them sprinkled all over your code. We've never seen that. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, keep those isolated to a single file. And now that only, it's, it's like the switch statement or the if statement. That is only going to work if you've got like that dependency injection or, or you know, some sort of substitute, substitutability set up so you can actually swap classes in and out. Because uh, if you're just doing an if statement in each of those functions and you're repeating yourself, you know, the same thing, right? You're, you're, you're spreading that poison. So uh, whether it's a if, def there or an if, either way, you're doing the wrong thing according to clean architecture. I, I, ideally, you're going to be able to swap those things in and you're still going to have those if defs somewhere, but you're going to keep them in one spot and it's going to control which set of classes or which set of components gets used. Yeah, and this whole if def thing, just so for people who have no idea what we're talking about, those are things like a compiler directives so that if you're in debug mode, then do this. If you're in production mode, do this. Yeah, I was, I was going to give like a really good uh, or, or actually, I guess, really bad example that I was guilty of a long time ago, where like in my C code or even C++ code, I might do something like if def debug uh, and then log out some kind of message right. or print out some kind of message either to the console or to, the lo to a log, right? And, you know, I'd have this stuff just sprinkled all throughout the code and it was like really easy for me for a debugging purpose, you know, if def debug, if def debug, like just sprinkled all throughout it, but it did, you know, it, it goes against what he's saying here. Cause I probably, you know, thinking back to it now, I would look at it and be like, Oh, you know what? I should just have the one method that's going to print out whatever I wanted to print out. And inside of that one thing, then maybe it should be making the decision about like, Hey, you know, if def, you know, debug, then do this. Um, maybe that's the answer, but you know, another downside of that kind of thing, having those if def statements in your code, um, whether it be for this debug scenario that I'm describing or if def, uh, you know, core i7, if def core i5, it breaks up the readability of your code, totally. which isn't a, one of the topics necessarily mentioned in here, but definitely, uh, you know, going back to clean code, right? You know, the whole point is to make your functions readable immediately, right? Then... Uh, that totally interrupts the flow of the reading. And there's a complexity score in things like independent or any kind of static analysis things that will show you the, the number of like, uh, uh, what are they called? Decision paths or whatever that, that can shoot up the complexity. And that would probably do it as well, right? I don't know if the if defs do though, because they get compiled in the, they're, they're the static analysis you're talking about is going to go on the, the that's compiled good, version. That's a good point. So your code's just hard to read. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, that's a fair point. All right. So yeah, the next thing we got here is we say letting all code become firmware is bad for the obvious reasons that we just stated before. It's a virus. Yeah. So going back to the example that Alan started with about like, um, you know, if you start embedding your SQL into your code, 
Well, we know that that's a bad thing, yeah. right? Uh, for one, you're doing like string construction of your SQL statements. Like you, we know that's a bad thing, right? But now we can phrase that in a different way because we can say it as, oh, you've, you've infected it. It's now become firmware. It's no yep. longer soft. You can't change this thing. <laughs> you, you've gone down this path. Um, uh, only being able to target or test on the target hardware is bad. Right. That, that makes a lot of sense. If you got to have, if you got to have the ATM sitting next to you everywhere you go, how are you going to do that at home? What if you yeah. got a late night that you got to do something, you know, away from the office. Right. And hooked up to the bank too. Right. So oh, yeah. like, every Boy. time you test, it costs me 20 bucks. <laughs> yeah. And another way to think about that though, is that it, that also implies that you don't have unit test at all. Right. And we, we know from past experience that like not having unit test is a bad thing. So if you yeah. can only test on the hardware, then that means that you don't have it. And, um, because you don't have those unit tests, now you got to remember all of the use cases that have to be tested right. on the hardware. Yes, a so you got to have like a running like punch list of like here are the the things I need to make sure I do that you know, and yeah. that, or yeah. that Joe knows, or whoever worked on the system for the past ten years knows. Right, that some person has to manually go through and do, and not only that, but they got to be diligent yeah. that they do the exact input. Or, you know, and, and make sure that they get the exact output. And don't get lazy or horrible don't mess up. Horrible way to do it because humans, we are definitely fallible. You know, we're going to make mistakes. So if you're relying on a person to do that, it's going to fail. Yeah. And the thing is, is typically when you're working on a mundane task like that, your mind has a tendency not to focus as much. I mean, there's even a, there's a Netflix. We've talked about this. There's a program on Netflix called like a, a brain. Oh. Brain games? Is it brain games? I think it is. I don't know where you're going. And so there, there's a show on Netflix that it, I highly recommend. It's called Brain Games. And it just shows you how your mind fills in the blanks. When your mind's mm-hmm. bored, it literally just, it's like, I'll make this up. And, yep. and, and it's a real thing. Like it, it will blow your mind, uh, uh, you know, pun. But if you, if you watch it and you see some of the stuff, you're like, wow, I never realized that because my mind disengaged, it, you just start making mistakes. Well, here's, a, here's taking this for, from a different angle. Uh, I believe it was an MIT study that said that as long as you had all of the um, consonants in order, that you could remove any or all of the vowels out of the words and still write the sentence and it would still be readable and you, you wouldn't even trip over trying to read it. You would immediately know what that sentence is trying to say. And so that's an example of what you're describing where in our, our minds will automatically fill in the gaps, right? But it might be critical to our application that we actually print out, you know, something exact and, you know, we need the software, we need that unit test to make sure that the exact thing was printed without some human's brain just going, oh, well, I can easily fill in the gaps and move on. Yep. Yeah, and so, actually, that's a nice teaser for the, we talked about doing a, a practice episode next. I'm not sure it'll be the next one, but we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be talking about that exact thing in uh, my presentation, talking about how your brain takes shortcuts for, for good and for bad. And that's why it's really important to build up good habits because when your brain <laughs> It's, it's so desperate to take those shortcuts and it desperately wants to be on autopilot that if you don't kind of have that good muscle memory built, but if you haven't codified good habits, then it's really easy to slip into really bad habits. And if you're in Orlando this coming, well, this probably won't be out by the time you do it. Ah, oh, dog on it. Well, yeah. hopefully you did an awesome job <laughs> by the yeah. time this is released, but yes. I'm going to make some videos eventually. So if you're listening to this and you want to hear or see the video, you should like come kick me and make sure I get it done. That's right. And then, so wrapping this all up, what have we learned in this book? So there are more chapters just, just as a heads up. Um, but we've, I think we've fairly thoroughly covered, I think what are the most important and, and just really uh, main points that this book tries to drive home. And so following the principles outlined in this will help make your architecture and your code clean and maintainable for the you know, foreseeable future. Yeah, the only section we didn't get to is the, the details section. And there's a few things we skipped along the way, but the details just kind of dives into more specific examples of how to handle some of the weird situations that, that come up. And it probably covers a lot of the weird things that we brought up too. So uh, yeah. I'm going to keep on reading. And, and if, you know, again, I highly recommend picking up the book. Like if, if you're not one of the winners, uh, you know, by, you know, leaving a comment on one of these, you know, pick it up. Check out our resources page. It's there. 
it's excellent. I mean, it'll make you think about code in a different way, not just something that you write in your codes clean, but thinking about maintainable systems overall. So, uh, you know, obviously it's one of the uh, resources we really like clean architecture, surprising. And then brain games. I found the link to it on Netflix. I've put that link in the uh, resources as well. Super fun show to watch, man. It, it will absolutely blow your mind. And yeah. And, and I found the, story about that I had it wrong it wasn't that their vowels were removed it was just that you could replace you could move them in round in any order and it was a Cambridge University not an MIT study that did it so we'll include some the links link, to that as the well link is fun <laughs> yeah uh, well yeah I, I, I'm trying to find the original story but that was like a Fox News story where it's all everything is misspelled and it is hilarious. It's so we'll, we'll include that link in there. And your mind really does just pick it up like it's nothing. Yep. All right. So now it's my time for the favorite part of the show. It, Joe never did pick one, by the way, still. <laughs> um, it's the tip of the week. Yeah, I sure did. You remember? <laughs> Would you, you picked this one too, didn't you? Uh, no, it's the dankest memes. Oh, <laughs> that's, is, that, is that still a thing? All right. Yeah, someone erased the rules. We need to get those back in there. Sorry, Slack inside joke. All right. I know some people hate those. <laughs> All right, what you got? All right, my tip of the week is, uh, this is a suggestion from Arlene because I've been talking about it nonstop forever in the Slack. Uh, why not hackathon? Um, I know being a card-carrying introvert that, that I've been kind of scared of in the past, but after seeing uh, some of our friends uh, over in Wales uh, this past weekend, uh, done really, really awesome, cool, fun, neat things. I figure uh, I need to do it too. So I'm going to be signing up for one in Orlando and I'm going to be giving a shot. It's kind of like um, this weird health app slash game jam. So if you got an idea, let me know. And uh, I'm just going to, I guess I'm going to show up stag and just kind of see what, see what happens. So it may turn out terrible. Um, but I have really good resources to read on what to bring. Uh, both the cynical developer, uh, James from Wales, and uh, Jamie, uh, or God Progman, um, made videos and slash podcasts about what they kind of brought. And it's really kind of uh, interesting just to see what kind of things and tools and prep they did for these hackathons. And just watching like that YouTube video or listening to that episode, it's like, oh man, I really want to do this now. It's almost like a camping trip, but like way nerdier. <laughs> awesome. I'm going to watch that video too. All right, so for my tip of the week, I encourage you to sign up for a new feature that is right now, uh, you can sign up for early access for Visual Studio Live Share. Now, you might say, wait a minute, but I like Visual Studio Code. Well, guess what? This works for that too. What this allows for is real-time remote pair programming within Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code. So, uh, you know, Alan could have his environment already set up and running. You know, maybe he's got the connection to a database or whatnot, and he can send me the link. I can connect to his system. And in my instance of Visual Studio, I can edit his code. He can see me editing his code and I can run it against his system, but we can both work on it together. Yeah. I mean, it is incredibly cool. And there's, there's a couple of things to point out on this because I, I love this tip. One is, it's your environment. If I send you a link, a share from mine, you load up your Visual Studio or your Visual Studio code, either mm -hmm. one, doesn't matter, with your theme, with your font size, with your layout, your Solution yep. Explorer could be in a different spot. It doesn't matter. It's yours, right? And then the other really cool part of this that is don't want to gloss over is he has to have no dependencies. Like if my app depends on Node.js and it's got to have Bower and it's got to have Grunt and Gulp and 5 million other dependencies, he doesn't have to have any of them. Like you are literally running off my system yep. with whatever code changes you want to make. Yep. So we're going to include that link in there and encourage you. We should all flood Microsoft with sign up requests to this so that this thing can come out as soon as possible because this might be like one of the most exciting technologies that have come out. I'm, I'm not joking. Like I'm super stoked about the idea of remote pair programming becoming super easy and plausible. Oh, it's so cool. And now one thing to note, 
you can download the extension. If you go into Visual Studio Code, you can actually look for this, the extension and you'll be able to download it, but you will not be able to use it because it'll want you to log in and it'll say, hey, you're not a part of the, the beta program mm -hmm. or, the, or the preview. So make sure that you do hit one of these links and go and try and get your, your sign up approved for the, uh, the preview. That, that's, that's a killer tip. I agree. Like when I saw this, I was like, whoa, um, it, it's amazing. All right. So mine, uh, there was another thing that was just sort of mind blowing. So if you haven't heard about WebAssembly, it's basically compiled code that will run in a browser in, in a nutshell, right? Like I, I don't think, it, and it's, and it runs way faster than anything else that loads in because it's literally system level type calls that are, that are working. It's like a small, really efficient subset of JavaScript. Right? Yeah, man. It, it is, it is crazy fast. And, and again, it's compiled. Like it runs off. If you're using .NET code, it's, it's DLLs. If it's, you know, something else, who knows what comes down, but it well, rate, let's say, let's back up just a moment. Let's give a, maybe a super brief overview on WebAssembly. Okay. <clears throat> it's a, like Joe said, it's a subset of JavaScript. But if you take a look at like how your JavaScript works today, you go to amazon.com, you download some JavaScript. The first thing that your browser has to do is compile that so that it can run. So when Alan says that it's compiled, a uh, compiled ba binary that you're pulling down, what he's referring to is the JavaScript compilation has now been moved from the client back to the server so that the compilation is only happening the one time and getting shipped as in that binary form. So that's where it makes up its speed because you get to skip the compilation step. Yep. And here's the really cool part. So Microsoft has been putting in some effort called Blazor, B-L-A-Z-O-R. And what this is, is basically being able to write your entire web application with C-sharp and, and doing your templates like your view templates within Visual Studio. Like basically... Uh, bye bye React, bye bye Angular, bye bye all these other front end client frameworks or GUIs or views or whatever. Literally, you can have if you if you want to boil it down to kind of what it is, it's basically ASP.NET MVC that gets compiled into WebAssembly and then just runs on the web. So you still have your CSHTML files that are like um, I, I don't know if they're using Razor syntax. I think they are. I think that's why it's it says they are. Yeah. So. So you've basically got those templates and then you've got your C sharp that you write that works with the data and, you know, pushes it in and out of the views, but then everything else is handled for you. Like if, if the browser supports WebAssembly, it'll publish it in a WebAssembly app. If it doesn't, it supposedly falls back. So for older browsers like IE eight or nine or whatever, supposedly it'll fall back and use the regular JavaScript route. Like you're talking about being able to write, Full blown applications and nothing but C sharp and some HTML templates with some razor syntax. Yeah. That's cool. You know, I was originally kind of pessimistic about it. I was like, you know, I've seen stuff that generates JavaScript before. I've seen stuff that generates, uh, you know, HTML, and it's never been real great because it's separating me from the stuff that I want control over. But then I remember, well, what about you know how Unity generates? web assembly and I'm able to do like to generate a, a full on JavaScript game from anything I do in unity. That's like 3d 2d. Like that's really cool. And it's been really great. And so I'm still kind of like wrapping my mind, my mind around what this can mean for the future, but it's really cool to think that like I can write something in C sharp that runs, you know, over here, maybe it's even a website and now all of a sudden I'm maybe running my website all in the browser. I mean, I'm still trying to kind of understand it. And you know, obviously I think that the main thing that they're after there is replacing those uh, or enabling those, those other frameworks uh, to do kind of cool HTML stuff, but it can also mean really big other interesting things, just kind of like the opening up the, the 3d capabilities or uh, translating 3d capabilities or whatever other capabilities of .NET into the browser. So it's going to be cool. Yeah, I think WebAssembly is like one of the most exciting things happening in the in web development right now. The fact that you can, you know, the, we will, that there's this roadmap to where we're going to be able to do, use strongly typed languages to write this code. If you want, you don't have to, but you know, uh, you know, because there's, there's other languages that will they'll support it. Um, you know, I just think, I just find that exciting. Yeah, it's cool. And, and on top of it, again, the speed. Like I've seen full on 3D 
apps running mm -hmm. in the browser that's just like if it was running in an application, an EXE that you fired off on your computer, which is cool. Um, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that, you know, you can see that they, they came up with the name Blazor because it was kind of like a, a play on the Razor part of this, which anyone that's not familiar with um, you know, .NET development, Razor is the uh, engine for using uh, in .NET to create your MVC app. Like the templating um, language? The yeah. View. Yeah, your templating view language. But because it's like C Sharp and Razor, you know, they could have gone like Crazer. Crazer. Or <laughs> just crazy. But I guess they didn't, I guess the, from a marketing point of view, they were like, that's probably not so good. Yeah. So, but, but I'm sure the blaze was on the speed though, thinking about it, right? Oh, I'm sure. So a, a couple of things to note here. This is, this is open source. You can go to GitHub and go to the page. You could put in a pull request. You can take a look at all the stuff, which is amazing, right? Like the fact that companies are doing more and more of this, especially Microsoft being more open is awesome. If you want to play with this, what I would suggest because this requires ASP.NET Core 2.0.4, or no, 2.1.4, which is bleeding edge stuff. What I'd recommend is probably go get a Docker image that has Ubuntu, like the latest version of Ubuntu on it. And then that way you can install .NET Core or get one of the images. Microsoft actually has Docker images that you can download with this already in it and run it that way, right? Don't, don't pollute your system with, with, you know, something that might not be ready for prime time. Uh, but definitely go play with it, man. Like it's really cool. You can go, you can go spin this thing up and, and download the Git repo and then run the thing. They've even got a demo up on the site and they've got a YouTube video. So I highly recommend checking it out. It's exciting where this stuff's headed. Definitely. All right. Who, who's doing the summary? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I guess um, me. This episode, we talked about services, test layers, uh, embedded architecture, and uh, some tips of the week. And uh, that's it for the clean architecture. Uh, it's the pen ultimate episode here. Um, there's still a lot of stuff in the book, a lot more to it. So we heartily recommend. Wait, no, this isn't the pen ultimate. Isn't that what pen ultimate means? No, I think that's no. like the best of the best. No, pen ultimate would be the second to last. Is it? Pen second to last. Last but one in series of ah, things. Second to oh, the last. Oh, wow, you're totally right. I, yeah, I guess I should have just said the ultimate. <laughs> this is the last. <laughs> the last episode was the penultimate. <laughs> By the way, we're done. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the way we worded it last time is we might come back to some of these topics in the future because yeah. there's still some. There's still a lot of book left with a lot of great topics, but we do want to move on to other topics. So, um, you know, hey, if you want to read the rest of this, then you should definitely leave a comment on this episode. You'll be able to find it at www.codingblocks.net slash episode 77. And you can leave a comment there on that episode for your chance to win a copy of this book. And with that, uh, if you haven't already, subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or more using your favorite podcast app. Be sure to leave us a review by heading to www.codingblocks.net slash review. Yep. While you're up there, go ahead and check out all our show notes, examples, discussions, and more. And send your feedback, questions, and rants to the Slack channel. We have channels like books and uh, episode discussion and podcast chat where we talk about all the sort of stuff that we talk about on the show and architecture and, and this and that. So if that's interesting to you, then you can send yourself an invite to that Slack and hop on in and uh, hey. make sure to... Hey. No, keep going. I was going to say, follow us on Twitter at CodingBlocks or heading over to CodingBlocks.net where you can find all our social links at the top of the page. Sorry, I had a, I had a, uh, a moment of, of, I need to say this before I forget it. Yeah, if you guys are going to be in any of our areas, Orlando or the Atlanta area or something, and you want to hook up, you know, holler at us. Let us know. We, you know we'll get out of the house. We'll, we'll come meet you. We're not totally socially awkward, so, you know, it might be all right. I'm so ready to get out of this house. <laughs> You look like you have something to say. <laughs> I'm just very tired. I'm getting squinty. Me? Yeah, you. Oh, um, I was just kind of thinking when you said about the socially awkward, like we're not totally, I was like, okay, well, I mean, I'm probably going to be socially awkward, but you know, that's just me. Yeah, it's all good. So, yep, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>